August 11th. Uh, could we please have a roll call, Tony? Jimenez. Perales. Here. Who was who sit here? Was it Jimenez or Perales? I'm sorry. I thought you said at NS. I apologize. That's okay. Um, Perales. Diep. Carrasco. Davis. I'm here. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Here. Oli. Here. Camus. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. Present. Uh, please rise. Thank you. Please rise now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America, of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to apologize. I'm going to be turning my monitor on off quite a bit. Uh, I've got a broken foot, so I'm going to need to uh, get into various different positions to elevate the foot. So my apologies for uh, the inconvenience to the public, but I, I won't be visible for various parts of this meeting. Um, Council Member, yes, <laughs> I, I, yes, I did it again. <laughs> um, Council Member Esparza will be providing us with an invocation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'm sorry to hear about your foot. Um, <laughs> I hope I hope everything is fine and there are no pins and things. Um, oh, there will be. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so uh, today's uh, invocation will be brought to us by Chopsticks Alley and Esther Young. Um, this pandemic has posed a tremendous challenge to artists all over the world, including here in San Jose, with the cancellation of so many events and opportunities that our artists depend on. This comes at a time when we as a society and a community have frankly never needed art more. The arts remind us of our common humanity, heal wounds, bridge divides, bind our communities, allow us to grapple with our past and imagine our future and nourish our souls, especially in these challenging times. Chopsticks Alley Art was founded six years ago by Trammy Cron, who happens to be District 7's newest arts commissioner and has been instrumental in supporting Southeast Asian arts and culture here in San Jose. Chopsticks Alley supports and promotes artists through art exhibits, classes, performance, performances and events, including the Salt Stained Home exhibit here in City Hall last year. Esther Young is a producer and project manager for Chopsticks Alley Art. Before becoming involved with Chopsticks Alley, uh, she worked as an arts and culture event coordinator at the beautiful Oshman Family Jewish Community Center, proudly presenting high caliber artists, authors, musicians, and renowned performers. She also co-produced several TED uh, Palo Alto events, coordinated speakers, and marketing. Since the close of live events, Esther has continued to support the mission of the arts by producing digital live shows, booking and interviewing authors over Zoom, and performing for the Sofa Street Fair. As a singer-songwriter, she aspires to reflect the truth of her own journey and the world as she sees it. Esther submitted a video indication for us today. She'll be performing her song, Lilith. Esther Young, on behalf of Chopsticks Alley, I would like to offer this invocation for today's council meeting. Thank you all for everything that you do. And on behalf of Chopsticks Alley, I also want to praise um, this organization and all the others who are working very hard to support artists of all kinds these days, um, especially those from Asian backgrounds. This is my song, Lilith, and it's based on the poem Lilith by the poet E. myself out of paradise left a hole in the morning no note no goodbye the man i lived with was patient and hairy he cared for the animals working late at night planting vegetables up to the moon sometimes he'd 
Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful song. Thank you for the uh, for the reminder, Councilmember Esparza, uh, to cherish the arts in this moment uh, more than any other. We certainly do need the arts, um, and we'll get we'll return to the arts in just a moment. Uh, actually, on several moments throughout this agenda, um, because next up is the orders of the day, and uh, I'd like to adjourn the meeting in memory of Eddie Gale. And before we talk about Eddie, I, I'd like to first ask if anyone on the council has any changes to the printed agenda. Okay, I, I, um, <clears throat> I'm sad to announce the passing of Eddie Gale, uh, who was San Jose's ambassador to jazz. Uh, he passed away in, in early July, on July 10th, uh, at the age of 78, after a long battle with cancer. And I think many of us know um, Eddie was a great champion of San Jose, particularly of our youth. Uh, my predecessor, uh, Mayor Norm Mineta, named Eddie the uh, San Jose's ambassador of jazz. And he was ambassador certainly for San Jose to the world, but also an ambassador in the world of music to our children. Uh, because beyond the days when he was uh, one of the leading jazz musicians in the country. Uh, he continued to be passionate about bringing jazz and music to our children, to bring music into the schools. And he was also a great advocate for healthcare for musicians. Um, he first came to our valley in the early 1970s. Uh, he came from Brooklyn, but he always called San Jose his home. Uh, he was, uh, he got to start completing an artist in residence uh, at Stanford University. That's how he got to California, but he quickly became well known here. Uh, and uh, certainly his records and his performances are greatly valued by so many uh, lovers of music, so many aficionados, particularly of jazz here uh, in the city and well beyond. Uh, he lived just next door here to City Hall with his, with his wife, Georgette, uh, on Sixth Street. Uh, he was a con continuous presence, even very late in his life, in the Horace Mann neighborhood where he was very active. And uh, I'd, I'd see him at community gatherings and be performing for the community and, and, and working through the school and so forth. He is the oldest son of Edward and Daisy Gale Stevens uh, and survived by three of his four siblings. And of course, his wife, Georgette, uh, who was, uh, who was a, a wonderful uh, champion for the community in her own right. And a, um, and, and my heart goes out to Georgette. Uh, he's also survived, of course, uh, by six children, Donna, Mark, uh, Chanel, uh, Tijuana, uh, Guilu, and Teonda, and his 12 grandchildren, 11 great-grandchildren, uh, and many nephews, nieces, and cousins, and his first wife, Marlene. Uh, this is obviously an enormous uh, footprint and impact he's had on our community. Uh, and certainly in a wonderful and large family as well. Uh, so I uh, wanted to uh, offer this in thanks uh, to Eddie's memory for all that he has done for our community, all he's done for American jazz and all he's done to help bring people together around the arts. Uh, I know that there may be members of the family who would like to speak and I'm just going to ask Tony if she's able to determine if anyone has requested to speak, to make any remarks. Um, I have four hands up. Um, okay. Dennis Kine, Joanna Stevens, A.L. Farley, and Tessa Woodmancy. Wonderful. Um, but uh, uh, Tessa just dropped off, so I have A.L. Farley. Yes. Could, could we start with the one who is uh, one, of, uh, one of Eddie's children, we want to? I guess we could first go to the family. I think that would be most Duana Stevens? appropriate. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I just clicked allow to talk. Thank you. Welcome, Duana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Licardo. Um, and to the city of San Jose, thank you so much for acknowledging and honoring my father, our father today. Um, you were right, and everyone knows his professional uh, history, his professional contribution, not only to the world of jazz, 
but also to the city of San Jose. I just wanted to say, um, when we relocated to San Jose in 1972, um, I just have this real distinct memory of our father telling us that this is the place that Dion Warwick's song was about, and that this is where we were gonna make our home. And he, he made, and he made San Jose our home from the early concerts at elementary schools in South San Jose to Mayor Norma Mineta uh, proclaiming him San Jose's ambassador to jazz to the li Martin Luther King Library holding his peace poetry contest. We watched our father, Eddie Gale, make San Jose our home for 48 years. And it has been a great home for our family. So we wanna thank you, Mayor Licardo, and the city of San Jose, its council members, its residents, and everyone for embracing us from Brooklyn, New York, and helping my father, San Jose's ambassador of jazz, Eddie Gale, to not only live his dream, to make his, view, his vision come to fruition, but also to bring all of the wonderful um, entertainment, education, intellect, um, empathy, caring, and everything that he brought to help San Jose become the city that it is today. I am so honored that my father was a part of that. Me seeing it from the early 70s develop into the wonderful city that it is today, that so many of my family members still embrace. We are so honored and want to say thank you, San Jose, for embracing us and for honoring our father for all that he has contributed, not only to the world, but particularly to his home, San Jose, California. Thank you, Mayor Labardo. Thank you to all the council thank members. You. Thank you, Dewana. Thank you so much for taking the time to to join us and to share your reflections. And uh, thank you also for reminding me that Eddie was a great champion of peace. And uh, I remember uh, witnessing uh, two of the performances he brought together youth for the peace orchestra that he put together and uh, what a great advocate he was uh, for bringing people together in peace. Uh, Al Farley, thank you for joining us. Al, I think your your computer may be on mute right now. Uh, it appears from here that your mute device may be on. Good afternoon, hey. Sam and, and the council. Uh, can you Welcome, hear me Al. now? Yeah, we can hear you great, Al. Okay, great. Uh, you know, th there's nothing else really to say uh, too much uh, following what Duana laid out. She did just a beautiful job and certainly had a, bird, a bird's eye view of the life of Eddie Gale uh, in, in San Jose. Uh, I met him at San Jose State in the 70s. And uh, later, uh, after he married my sister, Georgette. So, uh, and she was his number one supporter and I, uh, she couldn't be here. And I just wanted to acknowledge her uh, and her loss uh, in all this. So she regrets that and she sends her gratitude uh, to the city of San Jose. She knows she lives up at, uh, or you wouldn't know, but she lives up at Clear Lake now. Yeah. Lastly, I thank the body of the city of San Jose Council and specifically you, Sam, who supported uh, me in representing four of our deserving community ancestors and acknowledging them in city council meetings at my bequest over the past seven years. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Al. And please share our love with Georgette. Uh, Dennis Kine, welcome, Dennis. Uh, Dennis, your computer appears to be on mute right now. I think I'm unmuted now, man. Is that correct? There you go. Yep, yeah, we can hear you now. All right, welcome, I appreciate Dennis. that. Thank you, thank you very much. I've known Eddie Gale since 1995 and the uh, political science department at San Jose State, Terry Christensen was running it then, and Georgette worked there. So Eddie Gale played our graduation party that year for, uh, for the graduating class in the political science department. I would later get on board with him as his guitar player and spend 20 years as his sideman. And I just want to talk to you as a native of San Jose a little bit today. I've been here uh, my whole life, except when I was served in combat. I'm a fourth generation native of San Jose, and we need more people like Eddie to come here. You know, in the spirit of Black Lives Matter and the spirit of you know, the African-American struggle in the U.S. and right here in San Jose, um, you know, Rosalind over there, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
I'm here to talk about a man who had more integrity in his little pinky than most people have in their whole body, really. Like you were saying, Sam, his commitment to the kids was just unheard of to me. Uh, uh, you know, um, he was he was he was not just a revolutionary. He was revolutionary. I mean, he 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 did two albums on Blue Note when he was 25 years old with Larry Young and Cecil Taylor. He was 25, and then he fronted two: Black Rhythm Happening and uh, and Ghetto Music. Black Rhythm Happening has a song uh, about Tianda. That's his youngest daughter, as you mentioned, Mayor Ricardo Tianda. Um, Black Rhythm's happening everywhere. I mean, that song's a hit if you haven't. Uh, Mrs. Spars, I want to thank you for encouraging the arts in San Jose specifically today. Um, that's that's really big of you. And you got one. You got a young youth person in there. Eddie was about the youth. He wanted them to play, be happy, smile, and sing songs like that. His obituary hit the New York Times. How many people on earth their obituary hits the most read newspaper on earth? His did. I'd like to close it by saying that uh, 72 percent of Americans say the arts will unify us. That's why the uh, the Council of Arts says that. They've done the research, empirical data says if we have arts, we will become unified. It's, it's, it's there, as far as you're right on it, ma'am. You're right on it. And um, that's what I want to encourage you to do. Eddie Gale and our Inner Peace Orchestra, we were multi-gender, we were multi-age, we were multi-race, we were definitely interfaith. We were everything. So please remember that. When we promote the arts, we promote unity. And when we speak about Eddie Gale, that's what he stood for. So thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you, Dennis. And I'm sorry for your loss as well. Uh, all right, uh, I believe those are all the members of the committee who would like to speak at this time. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Vice Mayor? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, it was about over two years ago when I first even heard about Eddie Gale, and, uh, and actually I was embarrassed uh, the fact that I'd been in San Jose for so long and not uh, was not familiar with him. And once I learned about him and realized uh, his contribution to, uh, to music and the community. Uh, it really um, had a profound impact on me uh, to the point where um, we um, gave a, Eddie a, a commendation about two years ago. And we actually rebroadcasted uh, your uh, original commendation to, to Eddie Gill, <laughs> Sam, which was about a couple years before that. So um, Eddie is gonna be missed but I think uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to really recognize the contribution that he's made to our community and to music. I had the opportunity to um, uh, see the memorial uh, service that they had for him this past Saturday. And they went through his life and the artists that he uh, played with, which were the legends of jazz. And if you um, knew his background his experience, the contributions he's made to, to jazz music. I think San Jose, all San Joseans can, can hold up our heads up higher and be proud that Eddie Gill was the ambassador of jazz for San Jose. We're gonna honor Eddie uh, for, with a um, lighting of the rotunda from August 15th through the 20th. So again, another way to, for us to acknowledge uh, Eddie's contributions to our community. Thank you, Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you for, uh, for stepping up to do so. All right, um, is there any other? All right, I, I think um, we don't yet have a motion, do we, Tony? No, we don't have a motion for orders of the day yet. Move to approve. Okay. Second. Thank you. And I, I, again, I wanna thank the Juana and, and all the members of the community. Dennis, who I know was a good friend of Eddie, everyone for uh, coming to speak, uh, and Al Farley, thank you very much for for sharing. All right, let's uh, let's vote on the motion. Tony, am I now? Yes. Jimenez. Yes. Perales. Aye. Yep. Aye. Roscoe. Aye. Davis. Aye. Ms. Barzo? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Gamis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, we're on to the closed session report. Uh, and is there a report today? Is Ed, I believe, is with us. Is that right? It's Nora. Nora. It's Nora. Welcome, Nora. Hi, 
Um, uh, we do not have a report out today um, from closed session. Okay, thank you, Nora. On to uh, item 3.1, which is the report of the city manager. Uh, Dave? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate the opportunities as always and wanna start off with our unsung heroes. And today I, I wanna highlight the work of somebody who works very much behind the scenes and that's uh, Craig Justin who oversees uh, Civic Center TV uh, in the city manager's office. And he and the, the team from Create TV are responsible for broadcasting all of our city council meetings and, and other official meetings. Um, and they've just done an amazing job of adjusting to the COVID environment and continuing to broadcast all of our important meetings um, at the same level of quality that we would expect. Um, and as the council knows, we've had some marathon meetings <laughs> over the past few months. And uh, Craig and the team have been there every step of the way through all those meetings, making sure that the, uh, the broadcast continues on. Um, in fact, they've done uh, we've done over 185 hours of, of council meeting uh, time in, in the last few months. And so just really proud of, of Craig and the team for ensuring that uh, the community can continue to participate in these meetings. It's obviously very essential to our community that they maintain uh, uh, that involvement. And just wanna thank Craig and Create TV for, for all the work that they've been doing. So thanks, Craig. All right, now we'll jump straight into the, um, the EOC uh, update. I'm gonna pass it off to Lee. You'll also hear from, from Jackie and uh, Colin and Rosalind and Alexandria. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Dave, and good afternoon, Mayor and Council. On behalf of Kip Harkness and I, I will be presenting this afternoon. Um, Today we have a few things on the docket. Uh, first, I'm going to go over some uh, quick uh, emergency operations center update. Um, then we'll hear, hear from Jackie and Colin on our supported isolation program uh, and the communications around that, which is follow up from the past few weeks, as well as from Rosalind and team on development services. And then lastly, from Alex Felton from our IGR team on the legislative updates uh, from the federal side. Uh, we'll be doing the state side in a few weeks. Um, so the Emergency Operations Center continues to operate uh, nimbly to slow and reduce the spread of COVID-19 and support our, our most at-risk people. Currently, there are 342 uh, employees staffed in the Emergency Operations Center, which is slightly down from last week at 390. Uh, during this past week, we accomplished some of the following that I'll uh, review. Uh, first, the food distribution team. Uh, continued with no major gaps. This was led by Second Harvest and our amazing partners, um, producing uh, 2.3 million meals uh, countywide again. Our encampment dumpster pilot program is in full swing with dumpster, dumpsters deployed at five sites throughout the city. And last, uh, the, trail, the last trailers we received from the state at the beginning of this response were picked up from Kelly Park at the end of last week. So no trailers remain. Um, in addition, in addition to messaging on our supported isolation program, which you'll hear in detail uh, shortly, uh, we've also kicked up some of our messaging, uh, working with the census team to ensure that the community knows about the earlier deadline in completing the census. Uh, we will be supplementing the messaging out of the EOC uh, with, um, with upcoming uh, safely door-to-door -door visitation efforts to increase the awareness and the census completion rate compared to where we were over a decade ago. Um, we're also continuing to update signage in our parks as we open new amenities uh, and ensure that we are communicating safely and directly with our public on the latest guidance um, throughout the county and the state. Our safety branch uh, has released a COVID-19 safety assessment toolkit and checklist for city department managers as we begin to reopen programs. And we've scheduled trainings with all of the departments in the coming weeks to go over this toolkit. And then thanks to council's ratification of the alfresco orders last week, we are moving quickly to accelerate that program, including the installation of two parklets this past week on South First Street between San Carlos and William Street. And then lastly, uh, we will be holding a community leaders forum uh, with the nonprofit sector tomorrow, uh, led by Andrea Flores Shelton and our community and economic recovery um, 
uh, section to go over the community and economic recovery um, gaps and working with our nonprofit um, sector to ensure um, that there are no gaps for our community throughout this process. Uh, there'll be a morning, oh, there'll be a meeting in the morning and also at night tomorrow with those nonprofit partners. And with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Jackie Morales Ferran, our Director of Housing. Great. Um, thank you, Lee. You can go on to the next slide. So um, one of the tasks that the council asked that I follow up on was trying to get more clarity regarding when the uh, county was actually offering the supported isolation program. And before I did that, I just wanted you to be aware of, because we haven't really reported this before, the three options that the county provides to people who are um, who come back with a COVID-19 positive result. So the first option is to provide somebody who might need isolation or quarantine an opportunity to go into a motel in order to safely isolate. The second is they've also worked with people to identify if they have a place to isolate or quarantine but they may need some limited service and limited service meaning things that they would be receiving in the motel such as food or cleaning supplies. And uh, if a person indicates that that would be helpful, then they provide those necessary services. And then the third option is they're very sensitive to and aware that we do have some members in our community who might get a COVID-19 positive and would have to stop working and would not have any source of income during the week that they would have, week or two weeks that they would have to be in isolation or potentially quarantine or longer. And so if somebody needs uh, rental or financial assistance to pay for utility bills, then they work to uh, provide that assistance as well. So those are the three different options that somebody can seek and request help from the county. So I think I did not communicate, uh, I did not have a clear understanding until we went back to the county regarding how people are actually offered these options. So one of the, one of the reasons why people are, I think, um, slipping through the cracks is because um, as somebody who just received her uh, test results just one minute ago, um, you just get an email potentially, and it says you're negative, you're positive. And um, the offer of these three options does not necessarily come at that time because there are so many different ways that people are getting tested. What happens next is um, the information of who gets tested positive is uploaded into a uh, statewide uh, computer system. And then on a daily basis, the county uh, is able to download that data. But I think you may be aware there have been challenges with that computer-based system. When the county receives the information that somebody has tested positive, then they have contact tracers. And they have 300 people who are working as contact tracers during the week and 200 and 50 people who are working as contact tracers during the weekend. And these contact tracers have an extensive questionnaire, but, they, but what it means is they're calling back people. It could be 24, it could be 48 hours after the person receives the diagnosis, explaining or asking questions so they can determine of the options that the county has, what, makes the most sense given their specific circumstances. So there could be times when they're not able to contact the person because the person doesn't answer the phone um, or they um, are not willing to give specific information. And so there are definitely uh, cracks in the system. And that's why this whole push that the county is doing now and that um, we are also going to be joining is so important regarding getting more education out that these options are available sooner versus later. 
so that people can proactively seek them out instead of having to wait until they're actually offered. And so I'm gonna turn it over so that you can hear about how we're trying to support pushing this information out so people know to call that referral hotline number as soon as they get a diagnosis. Thanks, Jackie, and thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm Colin Haney, your uh, co-EPIO with Carolina Camarena, and here to talk about what we're gonna do to get word out about these resources far and wide. As we've heard from Council and others in the community, uh, this there might be people actually avoiding getting tested because they're afraid of seeing that positive test result and getting put in a moral dilemma where they have to choose between keeping their family safe or keeping their family fed. So we've been asked to help raise awareness of these resources. Uh, we're still syncing with our county colleagues, um, but here's what our strategy looks like at the moment. And we've begun some of these tactics. But first, we're sharing and boosting the county's own communications, both online and in print. At the moment, that consists of a flyer that the county has been distributing, that's in five languages right now, explains the support resources as well as the differences between isolation and quarantine. The county also recently, just a few days ago, launched an isolation quarantine support website. It's there at the bottom of your screen, sccstayhome.org. That website is also available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Tagalog. The flash report that went out last week, and those go out every Wednesday, contained all this information in a new section that we have uh, put in the flash report focused on testing, tracing, and support. So every week, this information will be included the pop-up testing sites around the county will be included, and the appointment-based testing sites around the, the county will be included. Those flash reports also get translated into Vietnamese, uh, Spanish, and Chinese, and will get shared on Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor. The county EPIO has also let us, know, let us know that they are preparing a social media campaign on the topic, and we're still working with them to better understand exactly what's going to be included so that we don't uh, move forward with redundant efforts. Next, we're planning on producing our own communications in digital broadcast and hard copy formats. We will be reinstating our popular influencer video series that we used a lot at the beginning of this crisis and supported isolation is gonna be our first topic. Those videos use trusted community leaders, local celebrities to convey a message in language. In fact, we don't even write the script for them. We pro provide some high level bullet points and we let those influencers write their own script in their own language so that it is authentic. We're working with the Office of Immigrant Affairs right now to identify the right spokespeople and reach out to them, get those videos in production. And we're working with our community engagement and compliance branches to target those messages to the right audiences. And of course, we know that there are many people in this community without easy access to the internet. And many of those people live in our COVID-19 hotspots. So to help reach those residents, we're including this information uh, first in a resources brochure that we're helping to produce on behalf of the Virtual Local Assistance Center. That will be distributed through libraries with curbside pickup, food distribution sites, nonprofit partners, senior nutrition sites, clinics, and more. The trifold is being fully translated like everything else. And we will also be exploring a media buy on ethnic radio and looking at point of service outreach methods like postcards, tent cards, A-frame signs, and, and locations of high activity. So this is uh, kind of the the three-legged stool we're taking on this particular topic, and it mirrors a lot of what we have done on other topics um, as we push uh, health and safety messaging. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thank you, Jackie. And I just wanted uh, to say thank you to, to Carolina and Colin for stepping into the EPIO role over the last few weeks and, and hopefully on a short-term basis. Thank you both. Um, now moving on, I wanna hand it off to Rosalind Huey, our Director of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. Great, thank you, Lee. Uh, today I'm providing an update on our efforts to drive development services during COVID-19. Um, next slide. I want to start with an overview on the items that we have been working on uh, and that we have previously shared with you. Uh, so first, uh, construction hours have been extended to 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. during weekdays on and Saturdays. And this helps our customers make up for any lost time during the early county order restrictions and helps to keep development projects moving forward. Um, we have extended building permits, all active building permits, 
um, and council will take action today to extend planning permits for two years. We have completed inspections for those inspection appointments that were canceled when we first went into shelter in place. Um, now in development services, we are experiencing pain points um, as it relates to permit issuance, uh, particularly for single family home projects and uh, small tenant improvements. And later in the presentation, I will share our, our tactics around that. Uh, we continue to conduct virtual community meetings for our development projects, including our environmental scoping meetings. And the Planning Commission, Historic Landmarks Commission, and Director's hearings continue to be conducted virtually. And finally, to help keep our development projects moving forward, um, staff will bring general plan amendments to City Council next spring for those projects that are not uh, ready for council consideration by the end of the calendar year. Next slide. So as it relates to our planning permit activity, um, during COVID-19, so for these last five months, um, we have taken in uh, 526 new planning applications. During the same time, uh, 338 planning permits have been approved. Um, and this includes over 1,500 um, housing units and 4.3 million square feet of commercial space approved um, in the city. So I do just want to highlight a few of these projects. Um, they are very significant in, in helping us in our housing crisis as well as downtown development. Um, so the first project was the Meridian Affordable Housing Project that includes 233 affordable units. The Tamian Station Development Project was also approved. Um, this project includes 569 units, including 135 affordable units. And then also just wanted to note the City View Plaza Project in downtown that council approved in June, which includes 3.8 million square feet of development. Next slide. So on the building permit um, issuance, um, I do want to take a time to, to frame um, the challenges that we are now experiencing around permit issuance. Um, and this is really related to the impact of our permit center being closed to the public for our over-the-counter services. Um, we have obviously experienced um, um, lower permit issuance rates. And um, because we no longer have the in-person interaction with our customers, um, it is taking us longer to work with our customers via email uh, to make changes to their plans um, and to move the projects along faster. Also, we noticed that our customers are also having to adjust uh, to submitting and uploading their documents um, electronically. So it does take us uh, a bit longer to work with our customers as well. So what are we doing to address the challenges? So first we are adding staff resources to help get our permits issued quicker. Um, we are offering overtime to our staff to catch up on permits issuance. Um, this will be both um, during the evenings, during the week, and on Saturdays. Um, and we have actually identified uh, 400 permits that require plan review that we're going to focus on in these next two weeks um, to get these permits issued. We have brought on a retiree rehire to support this permit issuance work. Um, and then last month, we hired a new permit specialist, and we are in the final phases uh, to bring on two more permit specialists um, to also help with the permit issuance work. Um, and then we're also um, reassigning one staff member from our inspection team uh, to help process over-the-counter uh, permits. This particular uh, team member has the experience um, in plan review and permit issuance, so that is going to help us as well. 
Next, we are implementing online appointment scheduling for new project submittals that require plan review, over-the-counter permits, and ADU services. Um, and also this week, we are, are expanding our online permit offerings so our customers can pull their permits right online. Uh, for, we're adding two different permit types to the online offerings. These includes the brace and bolt permits and storage battery permits. Um, we have also reached out to our photovoltaic providers and our brace and bolt companies to actually streamline their applications by creating master files to get them through the process quicker. Um, and then lastly, uh, to deal with the email um, backlog, we have created a separate resubmittal mailbox for residential projects. So this way we can pull out these residential resubmittal plans from um, the other emails that our customers are sending us on a variety of different inquiries. So as you look to uh, the graph on the right, um, this provides uh, a comparison uh, of pre-COVID um, activity to uh, what we are now experiencing. Um, so you can see back in January um, of this year, uh, we were taking in over 2,800 permits um, and issuing about 2,000. Uh, you can see in April of this year is when we took the big nose dive. So when we went to shelter in place, um, it was during uh, this time also that there were county orders restricting um, construction activity. Uh, but since that time in April, you can see how we have consistently uh, increased both in the number of permit applications that we're taking in and actually we've we've surpassed um, that number in January we're now over 3,000 um, and now we are about 2,000 in terms of um, issuing permits so we're pretty much back on track on permit issuance um, from January of this year next slide So regarding our, ins our inspection counts, and I've um, provided uh, information previously to the council um, on our daily inspection count. So I've, I've shared previously that pre-COVID, um, our average daily count was uh, 500 uh, inspection counts per day or 2,500 per week. Uh, so you can see here in this graph how we've been uh, tracking um, since shelter in place. Um, we, there was a, a period of time, it was the first week in June where we hit just about 2,500 um, that week. Um, we did experience um, a slowdown the week of June 29th, but that was uh, primarily due to a four day work week. Uh, that week included the July 4th holidays. So uh, we only had four days of productivity that week. And then you can see since that time, we're averaging about 2,200 um, permit, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 2,200 inspection counts each week. Next slide. So regarding um, the universe of inspection appointments that were canceled when we first went into shelter in place. So I've previously uh, provided this information uh, to the council. There was um, a, a universe of 2000 inspections that were, in, that were canceled um, that we have been working on getting those inspections uh, rescheduled and completed. Um, so we're really excited that um, over the last several weeks, um, as you can see in the pie chart, we've been able to get those uh, inspections rescheduled and completed. Um, and as of today, um, of those 2,000 inspections, there are 200 um, that are remaining where actually customers are not ready to have their inspections conducted. So we're now at a place where if a customer um, requests an inspection, we can um, get that inspection scheduled within 24 to 48 hours. So in essence, um, we have completed that backlog for customers who are ready for inspections. Next slide. So 
So I did want to take the opportunity to share with the council our continued work on development services transformation. Um, and I'm really excited that the team has been able to continue this work uh, doing shelter in place. Um, and as a reminder, uh, we did our major upgrade of our permitting system, which is called Amanda. We upgraded from Amanda 6 to Amanda 7 uh, in November of last year. Um, and really the importance of that upgrade was that it set us up for future uh, improvements, um, technological improvements. It's basically a new platform that enables us to add new features to our system. Um, so one of the things that we were able uh, to move forward with, we were already working on digital inspections as part of development services transformation, and we were able to roll out the digital inspection form of April um, of this year, and we continue um, to use that. So the key thing about the digital inspection form is that now our inspectors are able to input notes on the inspection on their tablets and the information gets automatically uploaded into our Amanda system. Um, and also our customers also have the ability to access that information um, through our public portal at sjpermits.org. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are um, providing uh, two new types of permit offerings um, online this week, um, as I mentioned, for brace and bolt and for storage battery. So that is happening. Um, and then uh, we're really excited to launch um, our electronic plan review for planning permits and public permits. Uh, we're excited that this work is on schedule. Uh, so that we will be able to release um, this um, at the end of the month. We are currently um, working to get our customers trained um, on this new platform. It's actually called Project Docs. And so now our customers will be able to submit um, planning permits, a cate uh, five categories of planning permits and all public works permits. Um, uh, they'll be able to submit plans um, online uh, staff will be able to review them uh, electronically. And the important piece about this is now that our customers will actually be able to track staff comments of their permits and also track the status online. So we have uh, a cohort of customers that we are training um, on this new system. That training will take place Thursday this week. And then on Friday, we have a meeting with our developers and construction roundtable group. Uh, we'll provide them with an overview. And then on Friday afternoon, uh, we will be conducting a webinar for any customer who uh, is interested in learning more about the new system. Um, and then lastly, as I shared previously, um, we are providing online appointment scheduling um, that will start next month. Um, and before I end, I just do want to take the time to thank so many of our staff who have been working very hard over the last five months. Um, in particular, I want to uh, thank Chu Chang, Bill Mang, Mark Garcia, Lisa Joyner, Maysoon Dahi, uh, Alex Powell, and really all of our inspectors, plan reviewers, permit specialists, and our planners for um, taking on a tremendous amount of work uh, and learning to adjust really well and working hard to serve our customers. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalyn. Uh, in the past few weeks, we've had quite a bit of movement uh, within Congress and uh, with the White House on uh, federal legislation and support for the COVID-19 response. And to review that with us today is Alexandria Felton from our Office of Intergovernmental Relations. Thanks, Lee. Alexandria Felton, Senior Executive Analyst with the Office of Intergovernmental Relations. Um, first slide. So on July 27, Senate Republicans introduced the Hills Act, and this is a $1.1 trillion dollar package that is in response to the HEROES Act that was introduced by the House Democrats. The Hills Act is a marker for where some Senate Republicans wanted to start the negotiations on a fourth release, relief package. 
And as of Friday, August 7th, White House officials and Democratic leaders failed to reach a deal for the new coronavirus relief package. In response to that, President Trump issued a series of executive orders on August 8th, taking unilateral action amid the stalled negotiations. The orders take a comparatively narrow range of actions for coronavirus economic relief that would first extend the enhanced unemployment benefits, extend the federal eviction moratorium, and institute a payroll tax holiday and defer student loan payments. The Constitution gives the Congress the power of the purse to approve any changes to taxes or spending. So there are questions on whether the president has the authority to unilaterally intervene on unemployment benefits and the payroll tax. The actions may also face some legal challenges as well. Additionally, as the president's order would require states to cover $100 of the $400 unemployment insurance payments, there is some concern that the states will be unable to cover that match. Governor Newsom actually stated yesterday in a press conference that the president's plan will cost the state at least $700 million a week, which is money that the state doesn't have. And currently, 75% of the state's share of the coronavirus relief fund is already committed. So what happens next? Um, the current path forward is unclear. While both Democrats and Republicans have indicated that they're interested in reaching a deal, We'll likely not see talks resume until after the Democratic and Republican conventions later this month. So Congress also faces a September 30th deadline for the annual federal budget and the surface transportation reauthorization bill comes up as well on the 30th, so on September 30th. So we could see um, a re relief package negotiations resume in September. Slide two, or next slide. Although the Senate Republicans didn't approve any new funding for state and local governments, the HEALS Act does include some new flexibility as well as restrictions for the coronavirus relief funds and the CARES Act. So first, in terms of the flexibility, the new flexibility extends the deadline to 90 days after the end of the state or local government's fiscal year. In San Jose's case, this would be September 28, 2021. It also allows state and local governments to spend up to 25% of coronavirus relief funds on lost revenue. And then under the new restrictions, state and local governments can't use their coronavirus relief funds for any type of pension obligations or to supplant non-federal funds like state or local funding. Next slide. Regarding our advocacy efforts, um, we're communicating with our delegation on the funding impacts to the city of San Jose and our, our messaging to our delegates includes demanding that the, any package passed by the Senate should include additional funding for, for local governments and providing an accurate and detailed picture of the city's economic situation as a result of the pandemic. And that includes lost revenue, service cuts, and the city's efforts to provide COVID-19 relief to the community. We're also working with key coalitions like the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors to amplify our priorities. So that concludes our report. I'll hand it back to Lee. Okay, let's give you Thank you, Alex. And uh, before we hand it back over to the city manager, just wanted to preview, uh, Kip had showed you some upcoming topics uh, for future 3.1 updates um, and to ensure that um, we are uh, meeting some of those subjects, but have the capacity within the EOC and are properly framing up issues um, in the same context of issues you might have in that council meeting. We've put together a bit of a horizon report, which we will continue to report out on uh, to the council and make it available. Um, but we will be coming back next week with the library learning pods and a domestic violence update. And in the coming weeks, um, a bit of an update on the coronavirus relief fund as well as some of our our fiscal recovery updates as well as our overall budget for the entire response thus far um, and a legislative update focused on the state specifically around the eviction moratorium since on that same agenda we will be looking at our own extension um, so with that that completes staff's report and i would hand it back over to you dave thanks lee and just want to thank the, the whole team for the presentations today and all the, the work that goes into it and uh, Mayor, we stand ready for, for any questions from you and the council. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to everyone uh, for all the information provided today. Very, very helpful. Uh, council Member Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to thank the city team and the county team on the uh, home isolation work 
that has um, that has been happening. I think it's fantastic. Um, and uh, and for my colleagues, um, I know we've gotten the uh, emails from the county EOC for elected officials, but um, those don't have all the attachments in the different languages. But if you go to the website, um, the uh, PDFs on there have all the isolation information in English, Spanish, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. And so um, I think uh, a lot of folks in, throughout our city will be, uh, will find that information really thankful, really helpful. And um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for their hard work. I think it really shows, I know that there's still some more work to do on the processes and the county is really pushing the providers to let people know um, right when they get the call or um, the email if they test positive to really try and go even sooner than a tracer. Um, but a lot of this work is fantastic. Um, and, uh, and then I also wanted to correct a mistake uh, uh, because there is the new number for folks who want uh, a motel room or need support and isolation and that is the, that new number which is seven days a week instead of five is um, the number that Jackie posted so I just wanted to say a big thank you and I look forward to really seeing this um, get spread out in our community thank you oh, thank you uh, Councilmember Davis thank you mayor um, I have some questions for Rosalind I really appreciate the update today, um, I, I can understand the, um, the difficulties in getting, getting up and running, and I really appreciate the, um, the discussion about the permit issuances. And I'm wondering, so I, I see the V-shaped, you know, what we had hoped for for our economic recovery is what we got for our permits. So I'm, it's good to see that. I, I'm wondering what the backlog is and how many, um, how many, like what the average wait time is for people um, to get their permits, because that that's something that I've, I've been hearing from, from my residents um, as people. And I, I understand there, there have been more, um, more permits submitted or, or applications submitted because people are sitting around their homes going, hey, we should really do that thing. <laughs> um, so, but I'm, I'm wondering how long it takes on average now versus how long it was taking on average before. And I understand there's difficulties on both sides, but we can't, we can't account for those difficulties being, um, we can, we can only, do as much as we can do. And I'd like to know how long it takes from the time someone contacts the, um, the permit office till the time they actually get their permit and how that's changed since pre-COVID to now. Yes, th thank you, Council Member Davis. Um, so yes, um, things have, have obviously changed. Um, and what we're taking a look at now is our data in terms of um, how much longer it's taking us to issue permits. Um, we were, we've actually pulled together some data that um, categorizes our permits because every permit type is different. Okay. So we've created um, four different categories. Uh, the first being single family um, permits. These are home additions or alterations. And we, that is the category that we have the pain point. Um, it is- That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yes. Whereas, whereas pre-COVID, um, it could take us from, you know, from as little as 20 days to 30 days to issue a permit. Uh, we're now at about 50 days. Um, and, you know, previously it, it was at 100 days um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've gotten that right down. Um, so we see that that is the category that we have the biggest pain point and where we're going to focus our staff resources um, to, to deal with those and to help our customers um, get, get those permits issued. Uh, for new construction, uh, that's another category that we've been looking at. Um, you know, pre-COVID, again, uh, about 50 to 60 days um, 
to issuance. Um, now we're we're about double that as well. Um, that is the other big category for for new construction. And then on I what I would classify as um, minor or over the counter type permits, um, things like water heaters. Um, we're not that we're not that far off at all. But so the two big categories that we're going to focus on on the single family small projects um, and any new big construction projects. Thank you. I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, can you talk a little bit more in detail about the online appointment scheduling? Is that for for everyone for certain size of project? When will it be used? When will it be rolled out? I'd like to hear some more details about that. Sure, so our goal right now is to roll this out and to have the service available starting um, in September, um, up starting next month. And in terms of what we're looking at to, to add, number one is to actually um, have our customers to be able to schedule their resubmittals. And this is really gonna help us with the email traffic and backlog that we've been experiencing. So that instead of customers having to constantly email and then staff getting multiple emails on the same item, we'll actually have the ability to schedule that service um, online. So we, we hope to see some uh, productivity um, in, in that area. Um, we're going to also make sure that all of our ADU services um, can be accessed um, online through appointments. Um, believe it or not, we still have customers who are very much interested in, in building those ADUs, and we know we want to really focus on those customers. So um, making sure that they have appointments available online and they can just do it automatically online will we'll help that segment of customers as well. Okay, so these are mostly for uh, the smaller single family home projects or for that that's what the online appointment scheduling that you're rolling out is going to be for. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and so that will, will it be, it'll be live for appointments in September or it will be live in September to start making appointments? It will be the website would be updated and ready for our customers to actually make their appointments online in September. Okay. Right now we're, we're just working uh, to, to set up the system to make sure that we've got everything so that our in order so our customers can to make access online. Okay. And will they be in person appointments or will they be like zoom appointments. Everything would have to be done still virtually. So yes, we can do Zoom appointments, telephone call appointments, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, so that's helpful. So basically it, it takes the scheduling piece off the plate of the, the um, permit specialists and, and so, and then it makes the, the asynchronous communication was the pain point was one of the problems. And so it synchronizes the communication so people can have the conversation and then it will take less time. Correct. The yes. Okay. A whole lot less emails back and forth. Yeah, yeah. always a good thing. I, yeah. <laughs> I think we would all agree with that. Thank you, I, I appreciate that extra detail. All right, uh, council member uh, Foley. Great, thank you. Rosalind, I have some very similar questions to Councilman da Councilmember Davis. Uh, and I know that we have been in touch with your office and I appreciate Robert and you reaching out to my staff to figure out some of the issues that my community is facing. But daily we're getting reports from individual uh, homeowners who have small projects, uh, remodels, uh, adding in square footage, that sort of thing that have been delayed for day for uh, for months now and uh, the frustration of the back and forth email. So I'm hopeful that what you're putting into place will uh, clear that backlog and make it easier for folks to get responses because what they're complaining about is not so much the time, that is it, but it is the back and forth emails and the lack of response. And you, I know how hard that is. We get a lot of emails and we try to cover them all. And it's just 
sometimes physically impossible to do in, in a day. And then the next day you get many, many more emails that you're trying to, to address and deal with. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate that your report is today because it's very timely to discussions we're having at, at my council office. Um, so did I hear you correctly that the, if you want an addition uh, to your house, it takes 50 days or it was 50 days and now it's twice that um, as an example. It's now about 50 days, where it's previously was half that time frame. Okay. Can you, um, all right, so I'm going to, but, but this doesn't reflect, how does this relate to resubmittals? Can you walk me through, I don't really understand the process of a resubmittal. When, if I have an initial plan, uh, to the planning department for an addition, do I have to resubmit? At what point do I have to resubmit? And how is all does all this tie into what you're talking about? Yeah, so when we, we use the phrase resubmit, um, that means um, a project has been through its initial review. So we've received um, the plans staff has routed them you know with the various departments that might need to also comment and that we've provided our initial set of comments that we need the customer to address and so when we say resubmit we mean that means that the customer has received our comments um, and is now making the changes to those plans and resubmitting those documents for staff to review um, and hopefully, you know, ideally, we only have to go through one round, but we know on many occasions it takes two rounds. So thank you for helping me understand that. So in the resubmittal process, is, is timing involved in that, such as, so the permit, the initial permit they get, it, it expires, do they have to resubmit based on an expiration of the permit? No, the permit doesn't expire. This is this is just going through the plan review process. So there's no expiration. Okay. And if we, you mentioned that we were pulling uh, an inspector to help out with the uh, over-the-counter permits. Pulling the inspector, what will that do to any backlog in the inspector's office? Yeah, very good question. And I have our building official and assistant director Chu Chang on the line to also probably want to chime in and, and help answer this question. Um, but we do um, on staff, we have inspectors who are also trained uh, to do plan review. Um, and we have inspectors who are actually in, in the office. I'm here now, they're actually doing uh, video inspections in city hall. So uh, we think we, we have the capacity to pull one of those inspectors to help us out on the permit issuance side uh, temporarily until we can get caught up. And Chu, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Rosalind. This is Chu Chen, a building official. Uh, yes, council member, we are definitely monitoring both, actually all three different uh, operations in our, from the permit intake to plan check to the inspection. Right now, our inspection site is pretty much cut out within 24, 48 hours, as Rosalind mentioned. So we are temporarily moved one of the inspectors who used to work in the permit center, already trained and know how to process a permit to helping us for the next months to clear off a whole bunch of the uh, backlog. Once that backlog gets removed, gets dropping back to our inspector level, that inspector will go out back to the inspection. Actually, that inspector is still doing one day that will keep their skill, actually, the know-how continuously. So one day a week, they're going out to the field. It's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, coming, so go, helping the virtual uh, permit center folks managing the permit issuance or acceptance. Thank you. So thank you. So the 2,500 inspections you uh, expect a week will not be affected by pulling the inspector for That's from his duty. Especially this inspector, because each inspector has their specialty. Right now, we're really behind some electrical inspection. The combo inspection electric is, is actually in pretty good shape. Electrical, so we're not moving electrical folks out for sure. All of them full. So you're, 
on that note, we used to have seven full-time uh, electrical inspector during the COVID because of quite a few, we're down to 4.1 electrical inspector because some of them are high risk and they actually have a higher concern. So we cannot use that into the field. So that's why it further reduce our capacity on the electrical inspection specialty. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rosalind, I appreciate that your uh, department is up and running and that you're looking at ways to make it as efficient as, a poss as possible and uh, decrease the amount of emails that go back and forth. Because as you said, the emails back and forth causes frustration, but it also causes a time delay. So from a council office perspective, we all we hear from community when they're frustrated. If we could provide them with a list of things, this is how this, these are the time, these are the things you need to do. This is your, uh, your uh, processes, some way that we can communicate with them either on our uh, website or uh, through Facebook, however, however we want to do it so that we're able to assist you by answering some of their questions that are typical questions we're going to get all the time, because we're going to get you get them, and then we get them, and then we have to ask you, and then we get back to them, and it come it becomes uh, very cumbersome for all of us to have to deal with it. So we, if we had some tools that might be able to help us to educate our community, it might save us all uh, time and our ultimately our residents some frustration. So I think that's all of my questions. I think Council Member Davis asked the rest of them, but I, I appreciate what you had to say. Your, your presentation was very timely and anything we can do to assist you in getting the word out and helping uh, facilitate communication, please let us know. Thank you, Council Member. We'd be very happy to do that. We have uh, lots of information, bulletins, instructions on our website. So we will be sure to send those links to all of the council offices so you can share that with, with your residents for sure. Thank you. Great. That's wonderful. Those are all the questions I had. Thank you. Council Member Camus? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, and. Um, my first question uh, is for Rosalind, since he's right here. Um, Rosalind, you know, the, the, some of the downtown and other um, uh, bars, for example, uh, if they have outdoor seating, there's a lot of them have a CUP, a conditional use permit, where it requires them to create, to, to have uh, dinner and lunch uh, menus. Um, is there a way to freeze that requirement uh, so, that, so that some of these can at least earn us? That eke out a small living? So council member, you may be referencing um, our Alfresco program um, that the Office of Economic Development and other departments are overseeing. So if this um, is for a, a business owner who would like now to take their services um, outside on the sidewalk, in city uh, public right of way, then we do have a program available to do that. And I'd be happy to, to connect you or those those customers with folks. I, I think that blog A is, I may be on the call right now to speak to that as well. Blog A, if you are, I'd, I'd love to get your, uh, is there a requirement that they have to serve lunch, for example, if they're a bar? Um, so thanks, thanks council member uh, for that question. Um, sorry, you can't control four year olds in the background. <laughs> perfect. She, I hope she's a big star on Broadway because her timing <laughs> is perfect. Don't worry, um, don't worry. Can, can you just, uh, can you excuse me for one second? I'm by myself, so let me just make sure she stops screaming. I will be right okay. back. I All right, I'll ask a different question and we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. So, so this other one is, is in, in oh my God, and seriously, the homeless encampment uh, issue. Um, you, you know, we have. Uh, you said you said that there was a five dumpsters in homeless encampments. Um, that seems like a small number. Are we rotating these dumpsters? Because I've I have encampments in my district that haven't been cleaned in quite some time. Are we rotating the dumpsters? I've, I've uh, yeah. Lee, would you like me to jump in? 
Absolutely. I saw you jump yeah. on. Yeah. So good afternoon, Councilor Kim. It's Jim Ortball, Deputy City Manager. Um, that's a pilot program. So our Beautify SJ response team, we have not put dumpsters near encampments or locations that have accumulated illegal dumping to this point in time. But we recognize we have to try a lot of different strategies and solutions to address the challenges we're experiencing across the city. So we picked five locations where we could easily access, uh, get access to dumpsters and address what's happening in those areas related to encampment trash or illegal dumping. So we're testing it out. We're seeing how well it can work, what it'll cost us, uh, how effectively and efficiently it can address the problem. And if it's successful, we'll look at expanding it to other areas. We're also looking at a variety of different kind of trash collection, trash receptacle kind of mechanisms at other locations around the city. What we've been reduced to at this point in time is picking up loose trash. Our crews are going out and picking up loose trash. Sometimes it's bagged, sometimes it is literally just loose and we're picking it up in that way. So we're trying to develop more effective and efficient ways. So it's part of a pilot test and we're gonna to look to expand uh, across the city to address uh, this growing challenge. Well, let me tell you, I've had so much trouble um, in my, well, as technically in district nine, it's, it's, and some of it is, it's in my district as well, but a lot of other complaints that I get is uh, on Almaden Expressway near the Highway 85 entrance and near Oak Ridge Mall and the trails, the, the trails that we have, they're constantly, the, the bicycle trails are constantly being blocked around the Guadalupe near, near, um, uh, Gunderson High School, the high school, uh, and, and so a lot of bicyclists are calling me. So when are you gonna, I'm, I'm, I don't feel safe bicycling here. Um, and so I, I want to know what's being done about that. And I, I know that some of the trash in the areas that I just described are not city property, but Caltrans isn't doing anything about it. We've complained more than a month with some of these uh, piling, I mean, huge piles of garbage on, on Highway 85 and uh, Almond Expressway. And in fact, one of the properties burned down, um, the whole grassy area burnt. And, and so I don't know what to do about it anymore. I'm so frustrated because we call, your, we call our department and, and they, we just hear that it's Caltrans property or if it's water district property or what have you, we just keep getting the runaround. And I, quite frankly, constituents don't care about their runaround. They want something done. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate that. If it is on Caltrans property, um, that's something, if you would, if you have something specific, Councilor, you want to forward to me, I'll work with our team on how we're coordinating with Caltrans and we'll ascertain what Caltrans' response level is, what they say it is, what they're able to do. Uh, there's no question that this challenge is growing in our city. We sent out teams across the city in July and surveyed and inspected over a hundred different locations to assess what's the right response in those areas from lighter touch garbage pickup to more significant regular garbage pickup to dumpster deployment. And we're formulating that, that uh, kind of overall strategy now. We're gonna be reporting back on September 1st about what we've developed to date and where we're going to continue over the next couple of months to formulate a, a broader plan that will address this. I'll be upfront though, it's going to require investment. This, this challenge that we're experiencing uh, is coming and being caused by a number of other kind of problems. And you know, we're working through to try and develop a broad-based solution, but it's, it is going to be a significant effort to fully get control of this. Well, so, so I mean, I could tell you the one near Highway 85 and, and uh, Almond Expressway, it's really county and Caltrans property. I know it has nothing to do with the city, but I cannot tell, I can't keep telling my constituents. So, so my advice, Councilor, why don't you and I talk offline about that one? I can get the emails and the different things you've gotten so that I can talk to our team and then we can figure out a way to talk with 
county roads and airports and Caltrans about it. So yeah. I hear you on that one. Probably you and I talking offline is, a, is probably a good way to, to most efficiently address that one. Yeah, I think I think my fr my staff is frustrated, quite frankly, because we're having our staff talk to your staff, and 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 there's still nothing gets done. But I will personally talk to you offline. Uh, that thank sounds you. Sounds good. Uh, I don't know if Blog is uh, ready to resume. I hope everything's okay at home. <laughs> yes, everything's fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's a good. I'm glad. Interruption. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so the the question was whether or not um, Canada bars is basically a bar. Um, they they want to serve hors d'oeuvres or what have you during the times that they're open, and um, and uh, but they're currently being required to serve lunch um, under their CUPs. Um, Got it. So your your question is really about um, the requirements that they have in their CUP. That's um, correct. Not not necessarily alfresco. So so actually, I'm going to hand you back to Rosalind um, because alfresco um, deals with kind of COVID specific situation, uh, and CUP is something that uh, is is separate than. than and they alfresco. and they are okay. using their alfresco model because okay. they've had to go outside for their. Their and bar can, I, can I butt in for a moment? Because there may be a, a separate issue. Is it even lawful under the state of California uh, public health orders to be serving alcohol outside if there's not food? No, I think, I think Mayor. I think you're right. So let us loop back. I, I'm I'm fairly certain that the the health orders uh, require the serving of food, and and you, it cannot be just a, an independent serving of alcohol. So we need to loop back. But I, I'm fairly certain you're that correct is. in that. Yep, that that's, is that is correct. correct. We, will, we will loop back next week's three point one to to firm that up. But that is currently the order as it stands from the but state and the county. That's not exactly what I'm asking. I'm saying that they're being required to, to to open for lunch when they only want to serve like a dinner thing. So that's what I'm talking about. Fair enough, council member. So we'll kind of tie these back together and get a better uh, uh, complete answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's all my questions. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I diverted the, the question in some way, Councilor Campus, I, I assume it was focused on what they were serving, but I understand you have a question about the timing as well. Uh, Councilor Arenas? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just want to uh, thank all the staff for their hard work um, and the updates around the supported isolation program and communications. I was really um, grateful to see uh, how this has been uh, built up so that um, our community can continue to be um, supported once uh, they've contracted uh, COVID. And so one of the questions I have is uh, the, the tracers, and this, this might um, be too detailed, but the tracers that, I think there was 300 tracers that you mentioned, um, do they only follow uh, the folks who've been tested at the public sites or is this both, um, uh, does that include Medi-Cal uh, families? I know the answer. It includes everyone who tests positive, that they all get uploaded into this statewide system. And then the county then downloads that. And, and part of the problem is getting that information in a timely fashion, because they've had problems with the computer system. But everything is getting filtered in to one system and then the tracer, tracers then contact them and they do have tracers. I didn't mention this, but they do have tracers who can speak multiple languages. Okay, good, good. I was just uh, wondering if it was only the publicly funded or the, those um, Verily sites or what, whatever sites that we've already set up in the county or if they also included some private um, doctors. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, and then my second question is the raising awareness of supported isolation, which I think is a great campaign to actually have at this point uh, where we, we're seeing our numbers really rise. Um, I know that, that there's a couple of folks who are working on this. Uh, I think it was Carolina Camarena, and I forget the gentleman's name who the other um, information public officer was. But I'm wondering, uh, are they, are you all working together with the county? Colin, it's Colin. 
Um, are you all working with the county or how are you working with the county to uh, coordinate your efforts? Because I, I understand that the county also has some outreach um, and some programs that they've just recently funded for very targeted groups. That's right. Yeah, the county has a couple programs. I'm more familiar with some than others. Um, specifically for this supported isolation and quarantine, they are rolling out a social media campaign uh, soon. I don't know the details about that. They just launched that website, sccstayhome.org. And then you're right, they have a community and business outreach team that I, I don't want to speak on behalf of our community and economic recovery branch, but I do believe that they're coordinating. Um, and that's going to be more of that in-person, in-the-field targeted outreach. Um, we also have our compliance branch uh, here in the EOC of the city helping with that kind of work. So yeah, it's a culmination of, of several different streams of work on our side, um, making sure that we have a good idea of where, for example, businesses are complying, um, making sure we have a good idea of where there are outbreaks of COVID, making sure that we know the languages spoken in those areas, and then putting into practice the best communications methods that we can to reach those people. I'm sharing everything we're doing with the county. The county is sharing what they're doing with us. And so we're, we're being as careful as we can be with two large organizations moving quickly to not do redundant work and to make sure that what we're doing is complementary. Sure. Well, one thing I, I thank you, Colin. One thing is informing each other of the work that you're all doing. And the other thing is uh, being complimentary of the work that you are all doing. And so is there, do, do you differentiate in any way uh, in terms of the county and the city? I mean, does the county just expect the city to kind of do its own, its own efforts? Uh, no, not at all. The, the county um, has its own EPIO team, um, similar to what we do. Uh, you know, I'll just use social media as an example. They are preparing a campaign and they've, they've kind of upped their ante with their social media lately being much uh, sharper in their messaging. Um, uh, there's a lot more urgency, I'd say even a little bit of snarkiness to their messaging. And we're gonna, we're gonna let them run with their messaging on the Supported IQ campaign. Um, and so we are filling in with our influencer videos. Uh, they're not gonna be doing uh, any videos, at least not in the short term on this specific topic. And so we've said, we're gonna go ahead and do our influencer videos. We are targeting uh, two videos each in four languages. And then we're gonna share those with the county and share those with our neighboring cities and towns for their use too, because this is a countywide program. The information is not specific to San Jose. And how did you determine that videos are the most effective um, way of reaching those uh, difficult to reach populations? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't even claim that it is the most effective way. It, it's been very effective throughout, you know, since uh, March, just looking at our metrics for our, for our online outreach. But we know that there's huge swaths of the population who are, are not following us on city channels. Um, so we're also looking at those analog ways. Uh, we're looking at um, radio messaging on, on ethnic media. To, so get the message out on the airwaves in language. Um, point of service messaging, so A-frame signs, uh, uh, door hangers, tent cards at businesses that are open, uh, ways that we can, we can catch people's attention out there in the field, in the communities that we've identified as, as most in need um, mm -hmm. to, to supplement that digital outreach. Sure. With, with any campaign, um, I know that uh, traditional media sometimes doesn't uh, reach uh, some of the difficult populations or the hard to reach or um, and so I encourage you to please look at those ethnic based radio stations folks continue to have those radios on I know I hear them all the time um, and sometimes you know I ask my neighbors to please lower that down <laughs> um, so so I know they're listening <laughs> and I think it's a very effective way especially for the older um, for the older community and one of the ways that that um, that they stay connected is through that and also uh, newspapers or uh, and there's certain newspapers that a lot of Latinos and, and uh, Vietnamese and certainly other ethnic groups uh, use. Um, and so I would encourage you to use those. I'm happy to share some of those that, uh, that we've used traditionally for Spanish or Vietnamese um, when we can send that your way. Um, I would just really emphasize that um, if you are taking a look at those influencers, that they are relevant to the groups, right? So if you're putting something on a, on a radio station that 
but that's Spanish speaking or Vietnamese speaking or whatever language speaking it is, that it's maybe one of those DJs sure. that they hear yeah. every day or what, whatever celebrity that, that they are used to. Um, because it certainly may not mean anything if, um, if any, any one of us here on on councils, you know, as a right. you know, um, we just are not that relatable as, as somebody that they've been listening to every single day, right? As um, as a, as a friendly as I think we are, uh, we just won't cut it. <laughs> and so I think there's a sense of urgency for me. Uh, to ask you to please, you know, put uh, press the pedal on this um, a bit more, um, as we are seeing a lot of uh, numbers rise in certain uh, populations, and you can really target those folks. Um, the other um, idea that I had was also um, I mentioned this uh, I think about a week ago, in that there's a lot of businesses, restaurants that are just uh, opening up very much al fresco before the al fresco idea was even there. Uh, 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 food trucks are just a thing of, of what uh, some folks are used to and they follow them, right? I mean, the, the food truck crowd is, is uh, they're, they're fans, right? And they will follow wherever those food trucks go. Um, we actually have one, a vegan uh, Mexican food truck if you, you know, you're, if you take a break between three to six during this council meeting, you can go to the 24 hour Nautilus on Aborn and try a vegan based taco or nachos, right? And so these are the places where people, you know, they, they congregate or, and may, maybe not congregate is the word, but they certainly patronize those, those uh, food trucks or those outdoor already um, pre-existing businesses, not the ones that are um, up in, uh, in the middle of trying to get that up and going. And so I would also encourage you to do some of that um, advertising there. Um, and, um, and, and who knows, maybe it just works out for some of those businesses to uh, be also advertised at the same time. Um, I don't know, some, some exchange um, there for publicity. So that, those were my questions. Um, and lastly, you know, I just want to um, say, and I, um, I, I know that that um, this is probably not not the most appropriate time. I don't know what when it would be appropriate, but I did want to bring up um, Danny Alci Perez, who I um, died on Sunday this just this past weekend. Um, he's not very much older than I am. I probably were around the same age. And I met him more than 20 years ago um, in uh, the PRNS department um, when he was a right connection specialist. And so um, he leaves behind uh, four just wonderful young children, a, a wonderful wife who also works for the city of San Jose. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that, that um, it's it's it, he is absolutely a, a community driven he was a very community driven person uh, you can see it in the way that he conducted himself every day um, on business here with the city of San Jose and how he served our community how he served youth and believed in youth um, and how he enjoyed uh, very much enjoyed uh, music um, and one of our other employees uh, Julio Mireles is, is somebody who has enjoyed music with him at uh, throughout the years. And so I know he's going to be missed from our department, um, from our lives and certainly the, his children's lives. And so I would encourage you to go to my Facebook. I will post this, it's a, a GoFundMe um, um, account for him um, as he leaves behind a whole family um, at a very young age. And so um, I just, didn't want to um, pass the opportunity to say um, how much he is going to be missed and um, and grateful for the work that he contributed um, while he was with the Parks and Rec Department. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for sharing his memory and for your support of this family. Um, I, uh, I I'd like to return this topic that Councilmember Reynas raised. Um, and Colin or Jackie, um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to get in the weeds for a moment because we know the county's doing a lot of things right now 
and they're scrambling to do a lot. And so sometimes, obviously, when you're trying to do a lot in emergency, um, you don't have as much time for the details. We all know that. We know that feeling very well. I, I want to know to what extent are we deeply engaging with the county about the messaging to make sure that the most vulnerable communities in our city really are getting information in ways that is intelligible to them. Um, by that, I mean in the language and in a very direct way so that they can quickly get the answers to their questions. So I just can put those questions out for there for a moment. And I'd like to just start calling by, by going to the website that you mentioned there's a specific website, the SEC. SECstayhome.org. Uh, stay home. Okay, I tried typing the URL different ways and I wasn't getting it. So I'm trying that again. Okay, so that is getting to the same page that I thought about. Okay, so I'm on that page now. And I had a little conversation with some of the county leadership about this issue over the weekend. But I'm hoping as a city we can really burrow down on details because you know this is really at the heart of our city we know where the contagion is affecting our community the most it's overwhelmingly in spanish speaking communities and latino and latinx and other ethnic communities in east san jose so if you look at this page i don't know if you have it in front of you could you pull that up um, yes i will and, and the reason why I'm encouraging this is I'm hoping there can be ongoing dialogue between our staff and their staff to really hone the messages to make sure people are getting what the information they critically need. If you go to this first, obviously it's in English, and then there's there's toggle switches on the top that'll get you different languages. If you have the question of, hey, I live in an overcrowded apartment, or I've got there are three families in one home where I live and I need to isolate, because I think my own personal view is that, that may be the biggest cause of the challenge that we have, which is overcrowded housing and people cannot isolate because of their, their financial circumstances. If you look at the table of contents, you won't find that question on this list. You can go to the home isolation steps. What should I do if I become positive or I'm told to isolate? And then what should I do if I found and, and if you go to that, you won't get the answer to the question, what do I do if I need to go find housing um, and I can't afford it? The only way you'll get that information is if you go to the button just below it where it says Santa Clara County COVID-19 support team, which is obviously not very intuitive. <laughs> and if you like, I could share this with everybody so they could look and follow along. But, but so, so, Issue A is even in English, it's not very self-evident to somebody who needs to find housing because they're COVID positive and they don't want to infect their abuelas or their, their niños or, or anybody else they're living with. So then if you go to that, that link and you, you're, you spend enough time on this site to actually go to the COVID-19 support team, um, and then you'll have an opportunity to go to PDFs. It'll say what the PDF is, but it'll be in the language written in English, Chinese, Spanish, Vietnamese, or Tagalog. Obviously, that's not going to be recognizable necessarily to somebody who wants to speak one of those languages. But if you were to pull up the Spanish tab, you, you actually don't see anything on that PDF page that tells you that they'll actually find a room for you in a motel somewhere. It just describes the difference between isolation and what they call quarantena, uh, uh, quarantine. And it describes some general services, but, and it talks about financial assistance, but you don't get the direct information that I think is on everyone's mind the most, which is I live in a, with, with several families, I live with a, a large family and I'm worried about infecting people. How do I get out, right? And if you follow to the bottom, you can get to a telephone and hopefully you can call during those hours if you're not working. And so it's not self-evident. And then if you were to pull out of, of this page and go all the way back to the top and look at the Spanish version of this home isolation quarantine guidance, you won't get that question listed at all in the table of contents. And you won't even get the link that gets you to the sheet that I just showed you. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying here is 
we've got to find a way to import the user experience more directly in this communication. And I feel like it's kind of on us as the biggest city and the city with the population that's most vulnerable. It's got to be on us to be communicating this really directly with the county and really for us to be checking in with our own community to say, is this helping you or not? Um, because if you go to the Spanish site, you're still going to have a very hard time getting this information. And if you're lucky, at some point, you'll scroll down to a, somewhere at the bottom of some page somewhere, they'll actually get you the phone number, which we all want people to call, yeah. which is the number that you call when you need to isolate and you're positive. So I guess then having all, said all that, thank you for your patience with all this, Colin. Can you tell me, are we in constant communication with the county about how we're honing messages, websites, uh, whatever's going on on social media, et cetera? Uh, I can say that we are in frequent communication with the county. I, I can't honestly say that, um, that they're acting on our input on their communication flavor. Uh, I, I completely hear and understand your point about this, uh, this pretty big wall of text with a lot of background and not a lot of action items. We have taken a different approach in our own communications. Uh, we got this in the flash report last week, and I'm well aware that the flash report is not read by uh, you know, a big swath of the San Jose population, but that's going to be used as the launching point for a lot of the other communications we do on this topic. And the message there, I don't have it in front of me, was you know you should get tested if you're worried about a positive result. There are resources. The county has people that can help you with money, transportation, food, and a place to stay, and here's the phone number. And that's right. the framework for communication that we're pushing forward. That's what you're going to hear in those influencer videos that we're working on. Um, and we can continue to, 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 to read, review, and offer suggestions to the county, um, but I want to make sure that at the same time, we're just moving forward with interpreting that thick, dense, uh, technical information, we're making it easy to read, easy to translate, um, and we're pushing it out, pushing it out in, in plain speak. I mean, as a city, we already approach things like our website um, with the plainest, most straightforward language we can, and that's the, the tack that we're taking with our communications on, on all this COVID information, but particularly as we're finding um, these, these clusters of, of hotspots, making it the information as accessible and easy to digest as possible is our priority. I can't, I can't say with confidence that, that I can influence the county's uh, tone that much, um, but what we can do is keep showing them what we're doing, offering to share our resources, which we have, we continue to do, um, and, and hope that they, they join us in simplifying this information, making it briefer and easier to access. Yeah, in some cases, it's not even simplifying. It's just make sure it's actually there. Putting it you know, in, too. in the language, yeah. And so, look, I appreciate what you're trying to do, and I know the county's trying to do a lot right now. Um, I just can't help but think um, we need to help and be their eyes and ears in some ways, and I appreciate we don't control it, but I appreciate sure. whatever you're able to do to continually provide a feedback loop, uh, particularly from the experience of the user. I think that's really important um, because we're the city with the most need. We'll... we'll Hopefully, we have our ears to the ground uh, about what people are thinking. Um, on, I guess on that um, point, uh, on the um, there's there's been a lot of concern I know raised in the media nationally over the last few weeks about. And I guess really this is probably a question, uh, not for you, forgive me, Colin. It's probably more for uh, for Jackie or maybe uh, Kip's not on the line, I take it. Is that right, Lee? No, he's not. Okay. Um, you know, you guys are probably aware that there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that the way testing technology is at this current point, we're probably spending 80 or 90% of our money on testing on test results that will never actually reveal a result in time for that result to be helpful. <laughs> in other words, to actually give somebody who's COVID positive the warning that they're COVID positive while they're still contagious and while they're still infectious. Um, because the way the viral loads work, within a few days, they're no longer contagious. They've been contagious for a long time. By the time the test results come back, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, and so 
that obviously then ties into everything we're trying to do around isolating and quarantining because with all the delay of getting those test results back, it creates bigger problems. Uh, if there's more delay in getting somebody isolated, by that point, it's really irrelevant. And, and I guess the question is, I, I know, Lee, you've had some conversations with Marty Fenster Scheib over what we're trying to do in concert with LA. Now six states have recently announced a consortium to try to see if they could go all in on a, what is, you know, I guess they call it different things, strip testing. Um, uh, there's another term, I'm, I'm, it escapes me right now, but essentially it's low sensitivity testing that can be done very cheaply with very quick results over large populations, which seems to be much more effective for at least enabling us to draw quick conclusions about where contagion is and whether or not we need to retest somebody. And I guess the question is, is there any city resource, um, given where a COVID budget is now, uh, is there any city resource if we were to try to pilot something like that uh, in a particularly vulnerable part of our city? Yes, yeah, so I think there's there's probably two questions to that, and um, you know, Dr. Fenster Scheib and I have been able to to chat about it a few times over the last uh, few days, and we were we we're on the call last week, which you were able to participate in with the strip testing and and phenomenal technology. Um, so, would agree with you on your kind of sense that that's what's going to move the needle. I think, you know, as we go through and kind of pivot and refine the the COVID-19 budget that we um, have over the next few weeks, I think that will tell us if there are resources to put into this. So I'm, I'm relatively sure in the next few days, we'll have an indication of what that may look like. I know for Dr. Fenstersheib and a few folks on that call, you know, being able to not just test it in a population um, that could be most infected, but having a bubble around it and making sure that you can test as many as possible so that it doesn't go to waste was really important. And that's why um, Rockefeller and others were trying to put so much money behind it to not just go into like say one neighborhood, but create a rather large bubble that can be tested because that would, would that's what would make meaningful change. So I believe I'm following up with Dr. Fenster so I have after council today to see where, where he's at, but I know he walked away um, from that meeting thinking that this was a, a technology and a resource that he would like to explore for the county and hopefully help um, get us to a pilot um, state um, like some of the other states that we're um, taking advantage of at Mayor. Thanks, Lee. I, I appreciate that and I appreciate that you're leaning in on this with Dr. Fencer Scheib because uh, it really seems to make all the difference in the world if we can get a test result back in 20 minutes rather than as Jackie described her experience, which I think has been the experience of most of us, just we might get an email, <laughs> you know, and it's it's a long time and it, it just, it doesn't make it possible for us to actually take meaningful action. Uh, yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah, no problem, um, we, couldn't, we couldn't agree more, so. Uh, on, the, on the, Jim, on the, on the question of trash collection, um, I, I know that we've worked hard in the last couple of years to set, stand up this bridge program for, uh, you know, really seeing the homeless as part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And, you know, with downtown streets team and with, um, um, with Goodwill managing, uh, trying to see how we can help employ people uh, who are homeless or recently homeless, helping us clean the city. I know there are constraints and I'm curious, Jim, as to what those constraints are in your view about beyond money, because obviously we know we need money, but what, why we wouldn't be able to say triple the size of the bridge program tomorrow. Where do you see those constraints so we understand what they are? Yeah, very good questions, Mayor. And I, I will be honest with you, I don't think I'm the expert on, you know, precisely where the constraints might come from. But what I would say is I think the, the volume and the size of the problem necessitate a, a bigger and broader response than just uh, employing unsheltered people in the process. Uh, we literally are using heavy equipment, uh, major equipment, dumpsters, to do pretty massive cleanup efforts that are beyond the scope of a downtown streets team or a goodwill. What we're deploying right now and what we are ramping up is a three-tiered response 
And we're using downtown streets team and goodwill for the more basic cleanup efforts. We're using the California Conservation Corps for kind of a mid-level response, primarily focused on our trail areas. And then we're using Tucker Construction, Clean Harbor um, Company, and our own city forces and Valley Water to do the major cleanups, like the cleanup effort that's going on at the Coyote Creek Olinder area this week, where literally are, we are moving tons and tons of debris out. Um, so, Mayor, it is possible that we would more we would expand and more broadly implement utilizing unsheltered people in cleanup and organizing cleanup efforts and those types of things. That may well be what comes out of our effort. And that may be uh, ultimately where we get to. Um, I think we need to work through and try out all three of these different strategies and tailor our responses to the needs of the different areas. We literally surveyed over a hundred locations uh, in July and we we're trying to develop different tiered responses to those areas, depending upon the conditions, the access, and the volume of trash and debris that's coming out of those areas. So we may well expand what you're talking about there. Um, we did go through the shutdown with the COVID. We've started all of them back up. We have streets team and goodwill under new agreements with additional money in them. Um, and we also, through our expanded outreach, need to figure out how unsheltered encampment residents can become part of that uh, effort as well, Mayor. So I, I think there is definitely more in that aspect of the solution. And I think we're trying to work through and figure out what is the right amount and the right level of response. So I think your questions are good ones. And I think they're part of what we're trying to figure out in terms of the most effective and efficient strategy. Okay, thanks, Jim. And, and I do appreciate there's a big difference between the kind of job you need Tucker Construction for and simply picking up trash. Um, and I, I, I got the sense from your description, and I may have misheard, but it's not as though you actually had literally city employees going out there picking up trash. And I thought, well, gosh, I know that... <laughs> I know, I know that we typically would want city employees involved for more complex situations, I'm assuming, and, and it seems like maybe that's something we, we could give to the Goodwills. And, and that's true, and I think we do. We have our city employees on the more significant cleanups going on, and we are more broadly deploying downtown streets team and Goodwill to, to many sites, handing out the garbage bags, collecting the garbage bags at back, doing litter pickup and clean up the basic stuff. So that's absolutely part of the model. You'll see and hear more about that on September 1st. Okay, great. And we'll also, will cash for trash also be part of that? Cash uh, for trash is part of it. It is. I mean, it'll be part of that report out. I mean, in terms of how that's we're doing. That's correct. That's correct. Okay, great. I look forward to hearing more. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then finally, my last couple questions were for, for Roner Chu. Um, I know it's been uh, difficult making the transition to video inspections. And for a while, I think it was slowing us down as we were trying to get up to, you know, using the new technology. Um, are we at a point now where video inspections is actually helping us accelerate or is it still uh, cumbersome? Uh, maybe I'll put this in here. The video inspection, we're still in the piloting phase from very small project to start. At some degree, the video inspection will not work well. Uh, in the pilot phase, by the way, experience, it's almost like our side and the customer side are both are learning. It's actually take a longer time for us to do video inspection instead of in-person inspection, even for small projects. Small projects, if inspection is, if inspector is outside, they can directly see something, make that direction or see. Through the Zoom video inspection, Actually, at this point, we take about, I would say, maybe 30% more time to do each one of the inspection. But what we're looking for is really start training everybody, get more familiar. So I think the benefit also the video inspection for the small project is the consistency. Because we know in the past, we always get the feedback, say one inspector may say something different from another one. 
through the video inspection because the inspector get a certain script for a certain type of inspection. So hopefully everyone has the same script. Uh, for example, we did uh, uh, for the battery storage in the residential garage. So the inspector had a script. You need to show us the diameter of the bowl, the length of the bowl, and the, so just a step-by-step -step going through that. So that will keep the consistency. No matter who will do the inspection, they will be consistent. But on the other hand, that takes some time because the communication back and forth to Zoom, outside also our, the, the system, the technology still have a lot of challenge for us, for people, the Wi-Fi system at home, different things. So it takes a little longer time, but I think it's long-term, it will definitely help for us to speed it up. So right now, actually, we are not actually uh, become faster, actually, it takes a long, longer time. But at the same time, we have all the high-risk inspector, they are not able to go into the field. They actually can do videos. We are training them to do video inspection uh, in their house. Thank you. Hope that answers Thanks, the question. You. Yeah, thank you. And I know you indicated that we, in particular, electrical inspection is a pain point. We've got several electrical inspectors who are COVID vulnerable. Um, is that an option? Is video inspection an option for electrical inspection? Thank you. That's really the question we're asking. Uh, actually, not. Right now, it's not. The, the same reason, because the, some of the electrical inspection, small stuff is we use combo inspection, single family home, everybody can do. Electrical inspector specialty only go to the high rise or much bigger project, which is that type of project is a high risk. We, can't, we cannot really do a video inspection efficiently to do the electrical specialty inspection at this time. So we're losing the electrical inspection inspector from the field to the so-called uh, house in their back to their house, but they are doing other type of inspection, not the electrical. We, we can't do the video inspection for the much more complex electrical system uh, at this point. And could you help me understand, Chu, is it, is it not possible to do that inspection without having people around you? In other words, if they're going into an empty building mm -hmm. and inspecting, isn't, isn't there, a, isn't there a, a safe way of doing it? I guess that's really the question. I was say the way the is a safe. It's a, it depends on I guess sorry to say so the definitions of environment of everything. Right now we have a very good uh, protocol for both our inspection side and the contract side. Everybody is very careful. It's a, it's a really the certain employee they are they have a pre medical condition. They are in the more high age category. Was so they actually are ill. So basically they cannot go out. But we still pretty much 90 some percent of inspection is doing in-person inspection at this point. So it, it is, I would say, safe. They're very careful. There's so many procedures in place for them. Every morning we check their uh, personal protection equipment. We make sure everybody follow the steps. So, so far, we are very good in that sense. It's, it's just safe, uh, just, uh, just a lot of concern. It's definitely, we need to be very careful, yeah. Great, okay. And I guess, Rosalind, I appreciate your responsiveness when I asked the question um, a couple of weeks ago about that, really seeing if we could identify the key four or five permit categories where we have the most uh, traffic and really trying to identify, you know, what is the duration from application to issuance and how are we doing? And, and I'm wondering, can, is it possible for us to create a basic dashboard for the council, for the public in some way so that I guess my, my concern is, is both external and internal. I mean, externally, I feel like we need to level set expectations um, because lots of people are fielding a lot of calls about complaints uh, that we may or may not have if people understood at the application process at, at, at the very beginning, how long it's going to take. And then secondly, I think it would be really helpful for all of us to see how we're doing and certainly to track progress, to find the pain points, to identify problems where you see obviously where the numbers are going up and then obviously to reward success when when the duration is going down and celebrate that success is there a way we can um you know make that part of a a dashboard of some kind yes mayor i i think um that there is a way that we will can be able to make the data available. I, I will say that I, I think that staff, we need some more time to um, really scrub the data and make sure it's accurate. 
Um, and I do, I want to take this opportunity actually to correct uh, an answer to a question, I believe, from Council Member Davis on the new construction time to issuance. We are actually tracking the same that we were this time last year in terms of time to issuance. Now, um, the data I'm looking at, we're, we're averaging about 130 days for new construction progress uh, projects for time to issuance. And that's what we've been tracking for the last year. So Mayor, to your point, I think the question now is for us to ask ourselves, um, what should the target be? Um, and what things we might be able to put in place um, to decrease uh, that time to issuance. Um, I, I would also say that, you know, obviously the ad hoc uh, committee on housing and development services has been, you know, tracking our work on development services. And perhaps this is something um, that we can present um, to that committee as well. Yeah, that would be great. I think it would be helpful. And I also just can't help but think that maybe it would be helpful for applicants to know this coming in, just so that way, you know, obviously a lot of decisions are being made about contractors and whether you spend money on this now or later and all that kind of stuff. And we could save a lot of other people aggravation and, and money. That is our customers. It seems like if they just knew uh, going in what the delay might be. So thank you. I appreciate you wanting us to take that uh, suggestion. Okay. Are there any other questions from the council, Councilmember Sparza? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just actually wanted to follow up on the secstayhome.org website. Um, the updated flyers are, if you scroll a little bit farther down, and I have asked the county to make them more prominent and easy to Thank find. You. But under the Santa Clara County COVID-19 support team heading, there are PDFs in English, Chinese, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. And we have these flyers in addition to the website. They were um, sent to us on the EOC emails that we've been receiving. Um, and they're a lot better. They look like this. Um, and then if you scroll down, it actually has the phone number to call yeah. and when to call it. And it's in, it's in all those languages. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we have, you know, we have a lot more to figure out, but um, it's a much easier to read uh, rather than the, the clunkier old versions of that. And so I just wanted to share that. Hopefully the county will make it more prominent on the web page. But for those watching and for my colleagues, all of us, these are really, really helpful phone numbers and flyers, multilingual flyers to give out to the community. Um, and so, and it's a, the checklist format is super clear on exactly what you can get and what the difference is between isolation and quarantine and how the, um, you can get meal support or you can get a motel or you can get these other things. It's a much, much better format. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Council Member. I guess the challenge is I, I actually pulled up that, that very sheet that you're referring to. Is that to get to it, um, on the English page, the way to get that that is to get to the yes. link, Santa Clara County COVID support team. There's no Agreed. question. It just says, "Hey, I need, I need, I need a place to stay." You know, and and if if you go into the, if you were to hit the Spanish link at the very top, you which wouldn't would see be a that normal thing to do, yeah, right. Which would be a totally normal thing. You wouldn't to be do. able yeah. to get and, to it. And yeah. I have asked the county to please make it more prominent. Uh, but in the meantime, our our communities need that um, need the fly the new flyers. Um, so that we can share them. Um, but yeah, to, uh, I'm in agreement. It's very, it's, okay. it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, that, we'll get there. It. We'll yeah. get there. All right. <laughs> thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you uh, to, to everybody uh, in the EOC and, and throughout the, the city managers team for all this, these updates. Dave, did you have any concluding uh, thoughts? Uh, no, no, thank you, Mayor. I, I wasn't sure if there were any comments for the public. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. I should have gone there right away. And I'm sure we do. Um, yes, uh, Molly McLeod, welcome. Hello, this is Molly McLeod. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. 
Um, Mayor Licardo, I completely agree with you on the importance of the um, communication. And one of the issues that I've been doing when I've been tweeting to you and to the city clerk is to include um, alt text and image descriptions. Um, the um, accessibility is beyond um, just the language of English, Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, but also um, American Sign Language, um, real-time captioning, um, texting, for example. The phone number for the county's uh, supported isolation program, 408-808-7770. Um, I tried to send a text and it says it's a landline. You know, consider somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing to use TTY is so old school. Most, many, many people have phones and they use text all the time. And in fact, that was one of the recommendations that was included from the PG&E Pacific power shutoff from October um, that the city of San Jose incorporated. So one of the things that's not included um, on, for example, the engagement questionnaire that's being circulated through Code for San Jose is any questions related to disability. This oversight not only goes for web pages, it took many months to get the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center um, put on the San Jose Local Assistance Center, and I'm the one that made that recommendation, it took months. The um, SV Strong uh, tells you how to get food if you can walk um, a mile or five miles. What about folks like my girlfriend who is isolated? Um, addition to that, Al Fresco, great supporting the businesses. What about doing like Boston and having ramps? No accessibility and no response to the inquiry from Michelle Mashburn about this issue. So we need to do better on accessibility. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, Blair Beekman. Yeah, hi. Um, to offer a bit of abs a bit more abstract ideas on that previous subject, Mayor, you talked about you need to be connecting with community more and learning statistics more. You know, I hope it can be a process of more than just data collection and surveillance that you're talking about. I mean, uh, I feel that, you know, you've made all these attempts at improvements towards the city website for public accessibility, basically, and I, it's still not very accessible. If I want to look up information, I have a terrible time finding information, you know, and how can you make that uh, more an accessible process to people? And like, uh, you know, is it time to open up more commissions, uh, you know, more city government? I know city uh, committees are happening more, but uh, city commissions and just the whole, how to develop uh, more commission meetings and, and, and all of that. Um, Good luck in those efforts. I think you were trying to ask about that and, and maybe didn't quite know how. So good luck in your efforts. Um, with 57 seconds left, I, I wanted to really thank, first off, uh, the cities of Oakland and Berkeley. I think they've done an incredible job with their policing efforts that I think has given all of us examples how we can work. And I think it just relieved a lot of tension for all of us. We can all think better and, and work in our own city terms now, asking important questions of this time where we we're kind of all blocked up before. Um, so thank you to them. And I just wanted to thank Ash Kara and his work that he's doing with Oakland and, and Berkeley and, and those cities have been doing a phenomenal job on, on housing issues and rent forgiveness issues. And, uh, you know, I just, I really hope owners don't have to be fearful of what is trying to be presented to them. And uh, it's really hopeful things for everyone. So everyone can be safe in a really difficult time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Tessa Wimansey? Okay, well, I've been on since like 9, well, one thirty, and you ignored me for the comments on the um, uh, the, the music guy. My, they, she said, oh, Tessa went off, and it is a problem. It seems like my, my um, hand goes on and off wrong, so there's a problem with the software or something, but you need to try harder. And you, Mayor Licardo, last week when I was on, you said, Tessa, are you there? Oh, no, you're not. You didn't even try. You're not trying. And that should have been the, the issue with the woman who said, oh, Tessa turned her hand off. You know, you should make sure. Is that what you want, Tessa? You know, we can ask twice. That needs to happen because you're not communicating. And COVID-19 with the anonymity of being on the other side of a phone, we have to work harder to communicate. So that's an issue. 
And then, so I had my hand up to talk about him because I was saying he was a young man, uh, relatively, in, you know, that died of cancer. And we have to really look at all the problems with cancer and how we're creating, that is the precursor to the COVID-19 is our respiratory, you know, problems. We have an F in, in air quality in San Jose and we're not addressing that. You're not addressing that. And then the other thing was, oh, our, um, you, didn't, you did not, I had my hand up to talk about um, the issue of the, you know, what is it called? The consent calendar. You went over that. You didn't even say anything about it. I'm supposed to be able to bring things up on the consent calendar. So you didn't do that. Oh, and if I was in your city hall, like Andrew Boone, and my hands go up like to my shoulders because I'm frustrated that you don't talk to the public, and then the police would be there. Police would be on top of me like they were on at Andrew Boone. And the Ms. Woodman, see, we, we haven't what? considered the consent calendar yet. Okay. That's coming hey, up hey, Sam, really appreciate your communication. Thank you. Really appreciate that. And so, you know, but that, that's the way your police handled, you know, the city hall. It was very, made me cry many times coming out of city hall. I should not be crying coming out of city hall. And then, of course, the damages that people are experiencing from police is terrible. Uh, thank you. Uh, Roland? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I really want to thank you about the, the comments that you made about um, the issues we're experiencing with the COVID testing. And, and I do believe that the solution is known as a COVID breathalyzer. It's currently been de developed in Israel, 90% uh, successful, and it takes 30 seconds to get a result, not 20 minutes or 20 days. And, and it's a lot less expensive than the current testing we're doing. So if you Google it, you will find it. Uh, the second thing I'd like to share with you is that I am extremely excited about um, online permitting. I mean, th that is something, you know, I cannot tell you how excited I'm about this. And with your permission, I'd like to uh, close um, with a uh, comment similar to what uh, Pastor just said is that I do apologize for raising my hand earlier. I never met Eddie Gale in person, but I certainly listened to and enjoyed his music at a seven mile drive in Brisbane. And the other reason I raised my hand right after invocation is because I wished I had been in the chambers to rise and applaud the young lady from District 7 who sang such a beautiful song. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan. All right, uh, returning to council now, uh, we're on to the uh, consent calendar. Uh, and are there any items the council would like to pull? Uh, let me uh, mention, I believe staff would like to defer item 2.11 until next week. Uh, and then council member Renes would like to pull item 2.12. Uh, and let me make sure I identify those so everybody understands what's being pulled. Uh, so first, that is uh, 211 that would be pulled, uh, I believe was the item relating to San Jose Water Company for water facility services for fire station number 37. That's the agreement. Uh, that would be deferred for one week. Councilman Reyes would like to pull 2.12, which is approval of the Indi Independence Day community event, uh, council by, uh, sponsored by her council district. And I would like to pull item 2.10 for discussion that's the grant franchise to Hummingbird Energy Storage LLC for PG&E Metcalf substation. Uh, are there any other items uh, to be pulled by members of the council? If not, we'll consider a motion on the remainder and we'll go straight to public comment. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, let's go to public comment on the remaining items. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see. Ms. Womancy? Oh, thank you. Look at you twice. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. So basically, I wanted to discuss the whole thing with the BART. And um, that is on the agenda there. And I know it's having to do with, um, I guess, the Berryessa phase one. But the phase two is critical as we go forward. And, you know, what we need to do in terms of climate change is always talk about it. So that's what I do. And, um, and then we need to, for, you know, really demand from our government to really take action because we are in the, we have to reduce 
50, the science, oh, that's the other thing. We have to listen to the science. That's what COVID-19 has, has taught us, is we need to listen to the scientists, not the politicians who are you know, having their hands greased by corporations. It has to be the scientists. So the science is saying that we have to reduce 50%. So what I'm saying in relationship to that, in terms of BART, is we need to reduce BART 50%. And that means two of the stations need to go away, especially the Santa Clara station because of the um, amazing amount of resources and redundancy that it has. And we have Caltrain electrification. And the fact that we're actually, the VTA actually has now put it on the um, ballot that we're going to support more the Caltrain. We, you know, there it is, it's going to weaken the Caltrain if we don't provide that as an alternative to go the one mile from, you know, to spend so much money out of BART to put it, to go that, that extra the thing to go to Santa Clara is wrong. And this is, we have to be so careful of what we do from now on. And that is what we need to do is reduce 50%. And that is what we're showing our community because we all individually have to reduce 50% as well, at least. And with the things that's gotten as bad as they are, my husband who's a scientist says, it really has to be 100% by 23. So that is our goal. That is where we need to be going. And everything needs to be focusing on that and not business as usual or helping support business. We've got to get back to food, clothing, and shelter. All right. Uh, Roland. Uh, thank you again, Mayor. So my uh, remarks pertain to um, item uh, 2.9. But, but before I go there, I would like to start with a brief update uh, on the BART ex extension for council members who do not sit on the VTA board. The BART various extension, which is phase one, was delivered, was basically half a project, delivered 10 years late and $1 billion of the budget, period. It currently says 250 passengers, so the investment is $10 million per passengers. Phase two is beyond out of control with a budget increase of $2.2 billion over the last year alone. For a total of $6.9 billion, including two new massive cut and cover structures on, Stock on Stockton and East Santa Clara, neither of which have been environmentally cleared. So moving forward, I would like council to follow the precedent you set with high speed rail and assume leadership for oversight of the BART alignment through downtown San Jose as follows. First, Please consider directing staff to issue an RFP for engineering services from firms familiar with non-invasive tunnel design in dense urban areas, including underground station design with entrances on both sides of Santa Clara. And last but not least, please reach out to the VTA and extend the scope of the master agreement to provide additional funding for these services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman? All right, to speak on items 2.9 and 2.12 on the consent calendar. The Berryessa North San Jose uh, is the final stop of the BART line that will be serving all parts of the entire Bay Area. It has been created as an imposing fortress of 60 plus shot spotter speakers, eavesdropper speakers that are spaced about five feet apart across the entire station. It seems five to 15 shot spotters uh, would accomplish about the same thing. I feel good minimal use practices offers a respectful logic and can still very well serve the deterrence element you are looking for. You already know how I feel of civil rights, how civil rights and civil protection practices can be a process a whole community can be involved with and build upon together and how this can contribute to the process towards more open shared community practices and conversation and health services. As we are beginning to open up questions, not just for government, but how all of us can better consider options of peace, sustainability, and equity in our local neighborhoods at this time, and in terms that can be very much, in terms that very, can very much lessen the need of the prison military industrial complex. All of this is some of the same logic of how the San Jose Eastside schools can end their SRO programs at this time, and how to invite a whole community to a process and to minimize the concepts, concepts of intimidation and fear from all sides. I hope this letter can begin a more open discussion around the VTA and the everyday community in the next few months, and that shot spotter eavesdropper technology and, uh, and at Berryessa BART should simply not be flouted as a cure-all defensive weapon or used as ostentatious gimmickry. 
as shot spotter tech it simply has an important secondary purpose to record every single word of every human being in its presence. This is simply the future to some. I hope someone can write back to explain this logic to myself and its civil rights and civil protection ideas. Thank you. And I would like to speak about India at another time. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Eric Shanyar. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I was, I'm available to speak on 2.10, the Hummingbird um, Franchise Agreement. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll come right back to you, Eric. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right. Uh, then we'll return to Council for a vote on the consent calendar first. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Rollins? Aye. Jip? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Marinas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. All right, on to item 212, uh, Councilman Arenas? This is, uh, I believe, an uh, official uh, city event relating to flag raising? Yes, it is. It's India Independence Day. Uh, so I will start out by saying namaste, sat sri akal, or salam. Uh, so for the past 12 years, the city has recognized and celebrated India Independence Day on August 15th. And this year is the 74th anniversary of India's independence. Um, and the legacy of those freedom fighters that achieved that in independence lives on not just in India, but also here in San Jose through a very thriving South Asian community that has made this city their home. San Jose also has a special bond with our sister city in India, Pune, which is sometimes called the Silicon Valley of India. My district particularly is home to many of our Indian American community, and it is an honor to sponsor this year's celebration and continue with this 12 year uh, tradition. While the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic precludes our tra traditional flag racing and reception at City Hall, I'm sharing a virtual background of the Indian flag, and I'm really glad to see we, we are almost uh, meeting a quorum here or pass our quorum with Indian um, uh, uh flags uh in your background so thank you so much colleagues for joining me today um i'd also like to recognize the indian american community organizations including dr ramesh chapra from festival of globe and raj verma from the federation of indo-american association that continue to preserve and celebrate our indian culture here in san jose and beyond as well as our Indian American city employees for their crucial service to our city, particularly in these very difficult times. As we've seen throughout the COVID-19 um, pandemic and shelter in place, much, many of my community members have stepped up and contributed by donating uh, PPE as well as money and, um, and devices to our uh, uh, device drives. And so I wanna recognize their efforts and thank them. But today we celebrate the legacy of Indians, freedom fighters, and the rich diversity of our city. Happy Independence Day. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Council Member. Um, members of the public would like to speak on Indian Independence Day. Uh, Tessa Woodmansey. Hello, yes, thank you so much. All right, Indian Independence Day. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, what do I wanna say about Indian that's related to climate change? Oh, okay, well, you know, the issue is, the whole issue of Indian independence is freedom from this, um, mon monop well, it's not called a monopoly, but it's a, um, the, the, you know, when they have coloni coloni colonization, um, you know, that is what we're, we're having to deal with. And what, what we're really, the root of a lot of the problems that we're facing have to do with capitalism. And this is where, and consumerism. And so when the Indians are freeing themselves from these you know, oppressors, that, that is part of it, to be independent. And that what we have to be is fiercely independent 
of capitalism and consumerism and the problems with India that are so m massive now with, with COVID-19 and climate change and how it's affecting and pollution is so bad in India. And, and that we, just like in China, we have exported our, our consumerism and capitalism to these third world countries and we are polluting there and we have to stop. I mean, this is where we're gonna have to need so much cooperation to really get this global agreement to go off of fossil fuels completely. And you know, these are the countries that are really suffering, like India is so much suffering with COVID-19 and people not having food and housing security. And so we, as how do we in living our lives really think about what's happening in these countries? Oh, let's talk about Bangladesh, a neighbor of India. One third of the country is underwater, is flooded. And this is happening, oh, in China, don't forget China, really bad flooding. And how we, as individuals, what we're doing to add to the problems of climate change. And that's why we really need to take seriously our 50% reduction that the science is telling us we need to do if, to avoid catastrophic change. Okay, catastrophic Blair climate Bateman. emergencies. Thank you, Mr. Woodmansey. Blair Bateman. Hi, thank you. Uh, in India's determination for independence and break from colonial rule, I hope it can connect to the ideas in this country of the need of good open democratic practices and how this can bring the ideas of peace, better reasoning and overall better practices. Uh, I very much still, you know, with the two items I'm speaking of, uh, past two items, I, you know, I, I would like to hear what is the necessity and need and good civil rights and civil protection practices of eavesdropper technology itself. At this time, it may be important to re-examine to balance and uh, to, to re-examine the balance and needs of community that works toward to better develop its its local democracy, to fully listen to and work with the voices and ideas of its individuals. This is compared with the uh, local communities that use a number of people as a body of people as a representational of one voice or one idea type of democracy that then calls itself a republic. Each individual has an important idea and can make an important contribution to the democratic process of a whole community. To listen and comprehend, and comprehend each other is how both transformational and everyday changes can possibly take place sooner in a community. I hope this is something of where, our, where we are currently at with our, present, with our current peaceful revolution of thoughts and ideas. A thank you to the steady long-term work of India and all of its efforts towards independence from colonial rule. The older questions of its caste system can possibly be a guide to the concepts of race, class, equity, and equality that are the important questions of this country. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to ask for a voice vote since this is a consent item. Uh, motions from Council Member uh, Reynas. Uh, I believe there was a motion, is that right, Council Member? Uh, yes, there was. Okay, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Uh, on item two. This is Tony, I didn't get a second on that. Oh, I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Should we vote again? I don't think so. All right, uh, I think we're unanimous either way. Okay, here we go. Uh, item 2.10 is an item that I asked to be pulled. This is a grant of franchise to Hummingbird Energy Storage LLC. And really a question, maybe for uh, our city attorney, maybe for public works. Um, certainly I'll support this. We wanna do everything we can to expand uh, electricity storage options. We know that's critical to our path for greater renewables. Um, but because I understand PG&E obviously will be the company that'll be the primary beneficiary of this. Um, and I wanna know if by granting a franchise, if we have any ability either now or potentially through a future city resolution to be able to condition a grant of franchise on the city's ability to utilize storage, uh, energy storage during a period of emergency. Um, and Nora, thank you, this uh, is Matt Kano with the Dep Department Director of Public Works. Um, I actually don't have an immediate answer to that question, but that is something I can follow up on uh, um, uh, and be ready to answer at the public hearing um, on August 25th. Okay, thanks, Matt. Thanks. I know it's a bit of a legal issue too, and Nora, I know I'm 
coming out of the left field with this one. But yeah, and and uh, we'll be prepared to answer that also, Mayor. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, fair enough. All right then. Um, we'll go to the public. Uh, Eric Shanauer. Good afternoon, Eric Shanauer. I represent ES Volta on this um, uh, this project, and unfortunately, I don't have the answer to your question, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is all very complicated with CPUC regulations, etc. <laughs> um, but I we're happy to work with staff to uh, uh, to get that answer. Uh, but I will say that um, this project. Uh, which will be a facility built uh, on San Ignacio in the Edenvale area and is already approved. The land use entitlement is already approved by the city, by the planning commission. So the uh, battery storage facility will be at San Ignacio. Um, this franchise agreement will allow us to connect the storage facility to the Metcalf substation. And obviously without that connection, the, the storage facility can't operate. Um, the storage facility like ours is critical to the city achieving its climate smart San Jose goals of transitioning to renewable energy. Um, put in simple terms, um, we cannot um, have more reliance on wind and solar unless we have a, a way of storing power um, at, and then using it at times that the wind's not blowing and the sun isn't shining. And uh, a side benefit locally to this storage facility is that it does enable the ultimate decommissioning uh, closing of the natural gas burning Metcalf Energy Center, um, which obviously has air quality and climate change benefits both locally and globally. So we hope that you'll approve the franchise agreement so we can move forward with the project. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Shinar. Uh, Tessa Woodmansey. Thank you so much. Um, so we're talking about this. Um, I wanted to say that I appreciate what you're doing in regards to um, the power a battery backup that is very, very important as we move towards us a more sustain well we need to move to a sustainable fossil fuel free future and then the other thing that i wanted to say is that we really need to have um this is part of this micro grid technology as we um are faced with the issues of pg e turning off the um the energy which happened in our you know city and the thing is that is going to happen again and they're putting in their big ads letting us know get ready you know, the emergencies are coming, the shutoffs are coming. That's because the problem of what happened in the, the Paradise Fire was because of the transmission lines. So we have to get off of transmission lines. That bringing the energy down from the Sierras, you know, having our energy with hydropower up there in the forest, that is creating a problem. And then to have these transmission lines. So we have to become hyper-local in our generation. And I know that's what Mayor Licardo was talking about, I hope but it's, it's talking about what they refer to as a micro grid. And the way that I see that really happening is that we really need to get solar panels on all of our homes. We really need to have that as a, as a program that is supported. And so we can be hyper-local and then we can have some battery storage centralized like in some local, um, relatively local, you know, with this Metcalf design. So the, um, the issue is though, we need to get solar panels on all of our roofs and or, and ideally have the battery you know, back up in our own homes, have off-grid solar, really be independent of PG&E. We have to work on that. And, and the only other issue is that we need to really tax heavily our gasoline at the pump and that it should be like $50 a gallon. And that, that money would then go towards supplying money towards solarization of our homes and getting that to happen to get our solar on our homes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for the first words uh, from the first speaker today. It kind of, you know, gave some nice facts about uh, what to expect uh, from this project. And 
I know that uh, East Bay Community Energy, they're, they've set up one of their projects recently to uh, create uh, storage for solar within uh, individual homes, uh, storage capacity. And it's a really interesting program and idea. And you know the idea of storage needs to be you know worked on, and that's what East Bay Community Energy is doing. And um, I know this this project you've been working on for a number of years now, Mayor. So it's important to you. But I just hope you can remember that you know there's a lot of ideas uh, besides PG&E, and and to learn how we can work outside of PG&E is vitally important at, in the next few years. I feel. I hope the community, local community. Uh, energy efforts is something the whole community wants to really get involved with at this time. If they want to really practice the ideas of good democracy at this time, I, I really think local community energy and the ideas of really working towards renewables and asking the tough questions, you know, how do we separate ourselves from PG&E and how do we create good renewable programs? You know, that's that's really good effort and energy by the community that it could be, you know, geared towards. And I think that would you know, bring out something really good in all of us and a really, you know, really good community future. So, um, you know, good luck in these efforts, you know, really check out uh, East Bay Community Energy is having four or five meetings every month, public meetings to, you know, describe everything they're doing and everything they're going through and learn to have, you know, to return of the uh, local community energy meetings in San Jose, you know, make it a, a, a joyful experience and thank you, good luck. Uh, thank you, uh, Roland. Thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I've addressed the, the council on this issue before, and I just cannot tell you how excited we are about this in San Jose. Th this generating plant was forced on us, actually was forced on Mayor Gonzalez by a former Governor Davis. Uh, and the only reason why it ended up there is because there happened to be the intersection between a major gas line and a major overhead power line. But the thing I really want you to start thinking moving forward is that once PG&E finally vacate Metcalf, this is the ideal location for the future Caltrain maintenance facility. When that happens, we will basically be able to have Tamian-like service in the whole of uh, San Jose, South San Jose. But not only that, we will completely eliminate all these deadheads, which basically is empty train movements, back and forth between Chamion and the CMOF uh, facility, which is just north of Santa Clara. It's a win-win for absolutely everybody in the city of San Jose, and the sooner we can make this happen, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, returning to council, uh, I see no one's hands up. Uh, is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. All right, since it's a consent item, I'll ask for a verbal assent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item 10.1. There are several items under land use consent. <clears throat> is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. okay. As a motion and second, again, since these are consent items, see no members of the public raising their hand. Mayor, uh, this, all, yes. Mayor this is Dave Sykes. Um, I, I thought that there needed to be something read into the record on item 10.1B. Oh, uh, I okay. I didn't know if the attorney's office, Nora, was pulling that or whether it was my staff, Rosalind. Hi, Dave, yes. I, I have the um, added language and I can quickly read it into the record if you like. That'd be yeah, great, thank, thank you. you. This was just a change in language, I believe, but we wanted to make sure it was clear to everyone. That's right. correct. Uh, so the amended ordinance was posted um, yesterday on the website. So we're adding section D to the ordinance, which states that notwithstanding the provisions of section 1A, 1B, and 1C above, this ordinance shall not extend the term of any permit that specifies that the permit may only be extended by an action of the director of planning, planning commission, or city council as applicable, following a duly noticed public hearing. Any application for the extension of the term of such 
A permit by the planning director, planning commission, or city council shall also comply with specific hearing notice procedures specified in the permit. All right, thank you, Rosalind. Uh, is that acceptable to make the motion? Yes, it is. And the seconder? Yes. Great. All right, on the motion, all in favor? Oh, Mr. Beekman just raised his hand. Mr. Beekman. Mr. Beekman, your device Thank is you. still muted. There you go. All right, no, can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, noticing my, my hand up. Um, I wanted to speak on is one of these issues about the substation uh, land. Uh, I don't believe so. Okay, good. Good to know. And then my other question, uh, tree cutting permits. I wanted to be able to talk about the trees uh, taken down in the post street alleyway. Is that acceptable? I don't believe this is a, this can be a part of uh, overall the removal of trees in this time of COVID-19 that uh, seems you seem to be going through at this time. I feel I have a right to speak on, on that matter. Yeah, did you want to connect it to a particular item, sir? Yeah, uh, item 10.1B. Okay. Okay, I, this should just this take to a do minute. With the extent, this has to do with the extension of permits for tree removal. Yes. And if I can have, uh, if you can put back my two minutes, that would be great. Can I have my two minutes, please? Thank Should you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I Hopefully this will just take a minute. Uh, I, you know, I've been trying to talk, uh, you know, the past few months, if you've noticed, uh, you know, I kind of just noticed the, uh, the, po the post street alleyway trees that were all removed and we replaced with, they were replaced with Armstrong maples. And, um, you know, I was reporting about this for the past few months that, you know, you could contribute your ideas, what you would feel. I'm a bit worried that they ended up in the last minute, they made a quick decision that they were gonna do two different sets of trees. They instead planted one set of Armstrong maples and they're a very long, tall, stiff uh, maple tree from the Southeast of the United States, uh, North America. And um, I, they're, they kind of look like cypress trees in a way. They have kind of that feeling. They'll be very clean and upright and, and trucks won't run into their branches. That was a major reason why they did that. Um, and it will just give a very clean appearance to the area. But at the other, at the other end of it, they're just, they're kind of boring trees. And, and the ambience, they initially had uh, a secondary tree, uh, a forest pansy it was called. And that was meant to kind of work as the, as a canopy, as an overarching canopy. Those got taken out at the last minute and I didn't know that. And so all of a sudden, you know, the, all these new trees are planted and I got kind of gypped. I'm hoping there still can be time to maybe convince, you know, for people to want to put in a second tree, set of trees to create a canopy feeling. If we can work towards those efforts, you know, I hope that can be, you know, done in, in totally decent terms and it doesn't have to be hostile or violent or anything. It just can be, you know, a good process. And uh, it's just a little too sterile uh, at this time. I understand what they're going for. I hope we can work on it. All right, thank you. All right, returning uh, to council on 10.1. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. There, I actually have my, my hand up. This is for oh, all- Oh, forgive me. Consent. Sorry, council member. Yes, council member. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to um, actually um, highlight one of these uh, projects, and one of them is a really great example of um, which is 10C, a really good example of infill development in my community. We have a lot of vacant lots, and as you all know, that when you see a vacant lot. <laughs> It usually means it has some level of mitigation that was really difficult for that developer to um, finish up uh, or to <laughs> rest at that moment. And so this is actually one of those uh, infill uh, opportunities. And I'm glad to see this actually come to a head and see that it 
finally, finally finished. And so I want to just thank the planning uh, department for their work, uh, for always being supportive of our applicants and making sure that we have as much uh, housing as we can have, um, even with these small lots, or it doesn't really matter, you give the, uh, the best attention to um, those folks who are going to increase housing for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, on the motion, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Uh, we'll go to item 3.4, which are improvements to the public engagement process in city council. Council committees and other pu city public meetings. Uh, in addition to the memorandum from Councilman Cross, I know there's a memorandum from Tony. Uh, Tony, would you like to discuss or present any of that information? I'm sure. I just wanted to. Um, we we broke down Councilmember Prowlis's memo point by point in the supplemental to respond to each one of what we've already implemented, what we're working in implementing, and what we can't implement at this particular time. Um, so some of the, the things that have been implemented are um, we've been um, sharing the screen with the vote. That was his um, number four. Um, I've been just sharing the, the motions as well when they're complicated motions. So we, we've incorporated those. Um, but a few things are, are sort of cost, have a, have a cost. So the significant one is the translation and interpretation services. Um, the, we've been doing interpretation of the council meetings via Zoom into Spanish and Vietnamese. And as you know, they, people who want to choose Vietnamese have to select German. Um, Zoom is putting that in their next update. That's what they, they told us. So that'll be changed within the next two weeks. Um, it's costing about $4,300 to $5,000 per meeting to have both languages. Um, so I'm budgeted for just Spanish and Vietnamese for approximately 14 meetings. It really depends on the length of the meeting. Um, so after that, we would need to come back for a, a budget adjustment to get additional funds. Um, the translation of the agenda and the agenda packet um, is significantly more expensive. Um, 44, our, our estimate for the June 23rd, which granted is a large packet, um, was 44,000 to translate the entire packet into Spanish um, and about 80,000 to translate into Vietnamese, but more than the cost, it was the time. Um, the, the two companies I contacted said it would take 10 to 12 days minimum. We post our agendas 10 days before, so we would not be able to have a full packet translated in time. If we were to just translate the agenda itself, um, that's about $4,000 per meeting, um, and that's a six to 10 day lead time. So we would probably have the agenda out the Friday before the meeting um, translated. So th those were our two cost implications. Um, other than that, you know, we've, I, I appreciated the suggestions and to be able to put things in writing. I've also created virtual meeting guidelines for all of the different chairs of all the different committees to know how to handle the public comment and, and things like that. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and just a question, Dave, on, on the budget, um, I know obviously we have our February mid-year. Staff was intending on coming back in the fall as well, is that right, to, to look at the budgetary issues we, we're facing? That, that's correct, Mayor. Um, we anticipate uh, revisiting the budget with the council um, once we have more firm uh, financial data that we can kind of do some projections on. So yeah, that is absolutely correct. Are we targeting October? What do you think? Boy, Jim just told me, and I don't know if Jennifer remembers. Yeah. I, it's, I, it's, it's October. Okay. It, okay. It's the it'll be at the beginning of October when we, and when we also do the annual report. Okay. All right, we'll go to public comment now. I, I would just, uh, just throw out there for consideration. I think uh, the, many of these recommendations are very good uh, with regard to the items that involve significant budgetary allocation. I think we wanna make those decisions in the context of all the, the budgetary needs we have. We, we have some very, very difficult decisions to make uh, in the year ahead and probably in the two years or three years ahead. And it's important for us to make those decisions in the context of all the, the, the critical services to our city. Um, Blair Beekman. Mr. 
Mr. Beekman. Hello, thank you. Uh, it seems city government is figuring out its problems and issues with Zoom and that a Vietnamese language label will start to soon be displayed on the Zoom app when looking for Vietnamese translation with the San Jose city government sponsored virtual meetings. With Zoom probably feeling a certain competition from a new Google virtual meeting space on its Gmail, this can develop a good logic and motivation for Zoom to work on this issue. But to respect the overall good efforts in learning how to solve these uh, previous issues, I hope it can be an example of how we can all get stuck in ideas of plans and formulas and structures from the past. And that seems we can never get out of. But with good intentions and practical reasoning, uh, individually and together, we can work to solve these problems and how bad ideas from the past get stuck in our modern attempts at progressive reasoning. A good luck in listening for what can be practical, good logic and reasoning, both individually and of a group. And a good luck in all the future efforts to learn how we can break out of and create good examples of obviously badly reasoned societal ideas and structures. And a thank you, we soon be able to be able to say again, uh, English, Spanish and Vietnamese language interpretation is now available at this time. Uh, and in the future of most all San Jose city government community meeting sponsored events. Uh, and that it can be safe at this time to give mention to the many other languages spoken at San Jose, in San Jose as well. To conclude, this is learning to invite a more natural practical thinking and a more individual yet participatory style of community democracy. Good luck in what this can develop for the future of San Jose. I figured this mayor is kind of what you were talking about in terms of democracy. You went into subjects of uh, data collection and that's fine, but uh, this is really good work uh, of your government. I hope you can learn to take these lessons and really learn to practice how this can broaden and be more open, uh, develop a more open community process. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Alex Shorn. Thank you so much. And a special thank you to Council Member Perales for bringing these issues up. We, we think they're incredibly important in the face of this pandemic. Speaking on behalf of Catalyze SV and a number of groups that are forming a coalition called Keeping Public Meetings Public. And that idea behind that is that God willing, the day this pandemic ends and we can be together in person again, that the option of Zoom has been incredibly important for making our democracy more accessible. And we would encourage the council and the clerk and the city manager's office to continue to use this tool to reach people. We all know it's not perfect and we all know it needs some of the improvements like council member Perales has suggested, the rules committee has passed, and the city clerk is now implementing. And we would just encourage the council to continue to think holistically about things. Community engagement is not easy and it is not free, but when done right, it strengthens our democracy. And I believe makes you all better decision makers in doing your job on the council. So as you look at the devil and the details, and the budget issues that the city clerk, Tony, put forward in her memo, encourage you to continue to have holistic conversations about community engagement. And as always, we stand ready and able at Catalyze SV to have those brainstorms as you come up with the best community engagement policies possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mary Helen Doherty, welcome. Uh, thank you. And um, on behalf of a few of my ALF urbanist colleagues, uh, thank you to Council Member Perales for this memo and for the Rules Committee discussion. And, and a big thank you also um, in a special way to our city uh, clerk, Tony Tabor, for getting us to this point. I know there are another fine tunings that need to happen so that we continue to broaden community participation in our civic process, but I think we have a good start. I spent my some of my morning at the County Board of Supervisors meeting and yours is better. So I just want you to know that uh, some people could participate in this one who might be more challenged to have done that one. 
So um, I did want to highlight one item. I appreciate that the COVID discussion was today at a time during the day. And we, one of the items in uh, Council Member Prowlis's memo was also addressing having housing issues happen at a time when families can participate. I know that your meetings go very long sometimes, and um, it would be good to try to get those housing issues early in the evening so that families can really participate before, you know, they have to get the kids to bed. So thank you very much. And I love the direction you're moving in. Thank you, Molly McLeod. Hello, my name is Molly McLeod. And I say my name before I speak because that's an access issue um, for people who are on the phone, um, for um, the real time captioning. If you say your name before you speak, and then conclude with, and that's the end of my thoughts or something similar. It gives a cue for transcript of which there isn't one um, through Zoom, but I understand on the YouTube that the captioning is available. I appreciate the um, listing of issues. Um, I also really liked the um, information about influencer videos um, earlier. And I'm bringing that up now because think about um, people with disability as influencers. You know, Do you have um, friends and connections with Dakara? The office in San Jose um, for those who are deaf, um, hard of hearing, deaf plus. Um, what about uh, you know on people with autism? The um, Autistic Self Advocacy Network has brilliant um, resources on plain language. What would it be like for community members, for all members of the San Jose community, to participate? It would be a lot easier if plain text simpler language, um, simpler directions on how to participate would be involved. What about polls where you can just find out snapshot, here's what people are thinking, okay, and a way to engage. And then did, was there any movement in the conversation? There could be far more interactivity and I bet it would be more interesting for council members as well as residents. Another thing I'd like to say is I use the free of by for all um, of by for all is a nonprofit organization it has a self assessment feature and um, for my city related projects did not score that well. So I know there's a lot of room for improvement and I suggest government alliance on race and equity, take the lead in this area. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tessa Woodman C. Thank you. This is Tessa Woodman C and appreciate this last speak all the speakers have been wonderful. Um, the thing is, I'm saying, Al Alex Shore said, you know, we encourage you to leave, to, to use the uh, Zoom as going forward. We don't encourage you. We demand that of you, okay? We have to start demanding what we need from our, our city, city government because the, right now what's happening is the leadership is not the right leadership we need. We need science leading us. We need you all to be scientists. And then what we need is a... a a graph to show the most important thing, which is reducing our, our fossil fuel use. So here it is. This, so then when we have this type of uh, technology this, this, that prevents us from driving in, flying in, whatever we do, we start using this. Not because it's, you know, you know it, it, of course, the, in, in politics and economics, you could say, well, we don't want the, the, the low, low, low class plebeians to be involved. We only want the corporations that, you know, help fund our, our campaigns. So this is where we have trouble with our current system because what you guys talk about is politics and economics when all we need to be talking about is science, which is biology, physics, and engineering. And getting back to this point of public involvement is so critical uh, that what I was realizing is that if you don't give us the chance to talk in the beginning of the meeting, that is really the problem in our society, one of the major problems in our society, because your business as usual is the problem. So the only chance that anything new will come in is from the public. And it, that's, that is why it's set up that way in, in well working cities, which is not ours. We are not doing that. And we need to have public comment in the beginning of every meeting, because what's happening is it's spreading like a virus to all the meetings we're at the end. And so this is where the leadership has to do it right. And then I, I guess that, that, that's basically it. Oh, the corp, uh, you know, the city council needs to have meetings with their public. All the members need to have, I don't see why we can't have Zoom where we can all talk. I've seen it at the library. You need to have meetings with all of us where we can all talk. That's how the library does it. 
okay? And that the, your our city council meetings are no a city council member Deb Davis is ignoring our. Thank you, uh, Roland. Thank you, Mayor. A um, lot of good input here. Uh, the only thing I'd like to bring to your attention, I believe you do know this, uh, there is pending legislation from uh, Assembly Member Kevin Mullin, uh, I believe it's Assembly Bill 992, which is known as uh, Modernizing the Brown Act, uh, is basically going to make the governor's uh, executive uh, order uh, permanent by, by basically ch changing the Brown Act. So uh, there's been a lot of good input, but uh, I do believe that that is probably the, the appropriate arena where this discussion uh, should be taking place. Um, you know, maybe incorporating uh, some of the changes that the, uh, the, the council and the residents are suggesting, you know, rather than the city uh, going off on its own uh, tangent and doing something entirely different than the rest of the state of California. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Largent. Great. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, apologize if I sound like I'm a little off topic. That's not what I'm trying to do. I had to pull over to the side of the road. There was an encampment fire on the side of 87. I just wanted to make sure everyone's okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Am I? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, we can. Great, great. Um, you know, as far as public comment, and I really enjoy uh, what, what Tess has to say, and when she's the mayor of San Jose, we're all going to be able to have our comment in the beginning of the meetings. I just don't see why you guys don't allow that to happen. And I do call San Jose, the anti-democratic city of San Jose, it is very difficult to participate. It's very difficult to put your grievances out on the table. Um, many people are Mr. Larger, me for exercising my democratic views, one person on a sidewalk utilizing sound amplified devices. You know, it's called a megaphone. Why do we have to go to a sidewalk? Why can't we bring our grievances into the chambers, into the council? And, and another thing that I, I, I am very curious why this is not happening is, is why is nobody ever being charged? Why is that happening? Okay. And why are speaker cards being torn up? I, I, I think that's a, a definite violation. I think something should have been done about that. Um, I tried to bring my grievances to the table at the city council, but I kept getting meetings cut off. I kept getting my cards torn apart, uh, just kind of pushed off to the side. Then I went out and exercised my democratic values. And then you came after me. And then now you're suing me. How is that even possible? I, I, I'm very, very confused. And the other thing is, you guys just really don't care. Let's be honest. You don't care. You want to throw me out like trash like you're doing with the entire homeless community here. It's very obvious. So, five years sober, just trying to be in my little girl's life, and none of you give a crap. Turning to the council, uh, Council Member Spartan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, first off, I'd like to thank. Um, Councilmember Perales for moving this forward. I think that this is a hugely important issue. And then when the um, when COVID started, we were sitting in the wing trying to figure it out and, um, and then have people in the chambers ask their question. Um, and we've sort of adapted and we've uh, moved uh, 3.1 and and then allowed public comment to 3.1 so i think that we've um we've tried to adapt um as things have as covid and the reality of covid and how long it's going to be with us um and and i think that this is really critical because now we do know covid is going to be around um a lot longer than we initially thought and so um we need to have public discussion. It's critical to democracy. Um, we've been running into how, how do we even notify the public, right? That things are happening. And uh, we've had a lot of discussions around the digital divide as school has started <clears throat> or is starting. And, you know, we, we also forget that we have a lot of people that don't have access to broadband. Um, 
and uh, and it's hard for them. And they live in overcrowded housing and um, are terrified, you know, of government and all of these other issues that we're trying to navigate. And um, so I think that we really do need to look at and support these changes to our process. Um, and we really need to look at, you know, the budget moving forward. How do you put a price on democracy, right? How do you put a price on the fact that we have we're going to continue to make big decisions as this fiscal year progresses. Um, and we need to find ways to include the public, to notify them, include them in, the, in our decision-making process. Um, and the suggestions that Councilmember Perales is, I think, a really important step to that. And I wanted to ask, I'm not sure if this would be the city manager's office, um, but one of the, um, things that we've been asked by residents is, is there a way for people to congregate with social distancing to hear a council meeting? Because again, they don't have, um, they share um, amenities like laptops or internet or one family in their household may not act, may have it, but the other household living in the same apartment may not access to it. Or may not access it. And so are we looking at aspects like um, for really big items, really big items that a lot of folks throughout the city might want to step up and have a say in or that have a lot of attention? Um, are we looking at maybe having a, a, one of our larger facilities and having a city council meeting on a screen and people able to um, to submit comments or listen to the council meeting and that kind of format. Thanks, council member. Um, I, I guess I wanna ask maybe Lita kind of help just give us a, a summary of kind of what the current state of the, the health orders are in terms of congregation, in terms of indoor and outdoor. I do think what you're asking is, is something that we probably need to you know, look at in the future when, when gatherings are more permissible. Um, you know, we, we obviously have been able to uh, pull off certain types of gatherings uh, as a city organization. Uh, on Friday, the mayor and I attended uh, the fire academy graduation, but um, the public was not allowed to attend. Um, uh, so there's, you know, it's, it's trying to balance the, the health concerns with, with obviously the importance of, of access to, to information and what's going on. Uh, but Lee, are you familiar with the, the, the current state of gatherings and what, what's permitted and what's not permitted? I believe it's yeah. 60. Yeah, it's a, currently there, there is something in the, the county's public health order um, that 60 and over are prohibited. Um, there's also, um, what we understand from the county, some conflicting language um, with groups of 30 to 60 between the county and the state. So I guess what um, we could commit to is doing that analysis and coming back on what the orders may look like and also um, if the county was ever removed off of the, the wait list and what an option might like that might look like um, if there were any large issues. So I, I think we could analyze that and come back. Yeah, I think it's worth pursuing you know, we have um, drive-ins and, and I realize that, you know, not everything is figured out today, but COVID's gonna be here another year, right? A whole other year is what um, we're being told to expect. So next summer, maybe, you know, we can start thinking differently or maybe not. And so um, we have to figure out a way on how to include people that frankly can't be, are being included right now. And so, um, so I just ask that that be added to the work plan over the course, you know, of the year. Um, I think it's a lot to do for every council meeting, but we really need to start looking at ways to include folks. Um, I also had a question for Nora. Um, so we um, waived, 
so we had a need to waive certain sunshine ordinances related to COVID. Um, the governor did some waivers. We as a council did some waivers. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, at what point do we need to, um, at what point do we say that's not necessary or what, what are our options? Does it have to go with the emergency or the, um, uh, yeah, the emergency, our state of emergency, or um, can we review the sunshine ordinances separate from that? We can review um, the sunshine ordinances separate from that in terms of timing, um, but there are still the limitations of um, the staff limitations, people being in, in the building, work being done remotely, um, the, the gathering issues, all of that um, has uh, made some of the, uh, the timing issues more, more difficult and more critical. Um, so I don't know if Dave has any thoughts on, for his staff, on staff memos and all those kinds of things. A lot of that was driven by remote work, as I understand it. Yeah, I didn't have anything to add. Um, maybe I missed so part of the question. We're weaving sunshine ordinances because of remote work. Um, is that it for the next 12 months because of remote work? I think we can look at as, you know, as a uh, staff in our office can look at what we're able to um, accomplish remotely. Um, I think some of that is getting easier and better. Some of it isn't, but we can look at those types of um, uh, waivers that we did on Sunshine and see if some of them uh, can be adapted now that we're in this routine remotely. Thank you. I think that would be really helpful. And I think, you know, from the initial discussions, because I believe we voted on that, uh, on the waivers when we were still meeting in the wing, mm -hmm. um, and kind of doing half and half, half Zoom, half in person. Um, and uh, I remember some of the discussions around that being also the fact that a large number of our staff were responding to the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and and that, uh, in in some cases, hasn't changed and won't change. But we are we are in that sort of routine, and I hope we stay there. I hope we don't have, um, you know, any crazy surges coming up. But but yeah, we have council to member, plan if I could, for twelve months. Mm -hmm. if, if I could, um, I, I guess I was misunderstanding maybe a bit, but uh, you know, we're, we're rarely now waiving um, the sunshine requirements. You know, I, I, I don't consider 3.1 under that category. 3.1 is a normal, is a report out, but we are doing our best to really agendize things through the normal process um, and, me, and meeting the requirements. I, I, I will state that there's been a couple of times where we, we've had to rely on the, the emergency provisions, if you will, but our, our kind of standard operating process now is to try to work everything through the, the sunshine, the normal, you know, uh, process of uh, ensuring that we've posted, uh, you know, 10 days in advance and we're agendizing through the rules process. Okay, thank you. And Nora, if you could still continue to do that review, that would be appreciated. Sure. And, and for, for example, I know even the physical posting where our office used to do that, we're relying on security staff now. To, there have been workarounds um, uh, that have, as we, we all try to make this work and, and uh, give the public as much information as we can, as timely as we can. Thank you, appreciate it. And um, I won't make a motion, I'll leave it to my colleague to make the motion. Sorry, I was on mute there. Uh, Councilmember Cross. Yeah, thank you very much, Mayor. And uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Esparza. Um, and thank you, staff, for responding quickly. Mayor, yourself as well. Um, and uh, the ALF fellows um, that helped to pull together uh, these recommendations. Uh, certainly, we are in unprecedented times. 
uh, I don't think any of us could have assumed uh, this is where we would be um, back at the beginning of this year and uh, that we would be likely concluding this whole year um, you know, or at least the majority of it since March uh, with virtual meetings. And that looks like the trajectory that we're on now. And so for me, as uh, we were already several months into this pandemic and engaging our community in a new way, I felt it was important and so did a, a lot of our community members we were hearing from uh, that we we made some changes. Now, granted, we had already made a lot and the state had adapted um, its regulations for us, uh, but indeed, um, this is not something that we were able to take the time to prepare for. And so a couple months in uh, and with the, the help of some ALF fellows, uh, I was able to, to draft up some of these recommendations. Uh, certainly, it's not all inclusive on the things that we may want to, to change about how we interact with our community, with the public, um, uh, and how they interact with us. Uh, but it was something that I had seen as um, uh, a list of, of, of opportunities that we could already act on. And I do appreciate, Mayor, you um, acting swiftly, Tony, yourself as well, Mayor, your team as well, I know, uh, right, in, in uh, response to this, to try and, and be more uh, helpful and transparent for our community to, to engage. And um, I know, and in, in from the report, thank you, um, Tony, for responding back that, that certainly there would be a cost to some of these, especially the translation being the biggest cost. Um, our hope was to be able to use some of the best practices and maybe the tools that we have. And Tony, you did speak to that in the, the memo in regards to using automated translation services and, uh, and how uh, those are not perfect, as we know today. And we would want to double check them before, uh, especially with some of the technical uh, information that we have out there. Uh, want to double check them before we that we actually post and uh, the the cost can get rather high with um, some of the full agenda packets uh, being needed. I think we've had this conversation now actually for a couple of years in regards to the opportunity of translation services during council meetings on specific items um, and I and I actually think the uh, the ability that what what zoom has provided is uh, is very helpful. I think we're helping them as well, right? With just simple things like uh, denoting Vietnamese as a as a an op an option, um, and and that's what we're looking for, right? Is just progress in this regard. I recognize we're not going to see some of these changes, uh, or I recognize we're not going to see all of these changes immediately. Uh, we have seen some of them. I do appreciate that, and um, and I appreciate the response and and how we can begin to continue to or con continue to look forward and have the discussion. Uh, in regards to the budget and, and what we may be able to afford. Um, I, I know I have appreciated uh, the fact that we have had the, the Vietnamese and the Spanish translation uh, with each of these meetings. I know what we have had in the past, certainly when, whether it was budget constraints or it was personnel, uh, right, having uh, an as needed basis. I felt that um, certainly that was in, inadequate and it was in, even inadequate when we had it in person at the council meetings because at times uh, we didn't know exactly when we might need it. And so we might assume we need it on one uh, day and then the next not and oh, lo and behold, uh, we have a number of um, English or excuse me, non-English speakers um, and we don't have the translators on hand. And so that's certainly always been a, a challenge and just a, a barrier that we don't want to have our community members engage, but I, I recognize the reality behind uh, the cost of, of having that, um, whether it's translation of the materials and the documents ahead of time, or just the reality of having uh, the, the, the translators on hand for every single meeting. Uh, but I appreciate the, the progress to date and I'll make a motion to approve the, the staff recommendation and, um, and look forward to the discussions we can have in the months to come around uh, the budget and further opportunities. Second. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Foley? Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you also, Council Member Perales, for bringing this issue up. Uh, community engagement is hugely important to all of our council offices and all, and to the community. It's important that we listen to what our community has to say and we allow access to them in an easy way. The translation, uh, it, that we've uh, implemented a few meetings ago is really critical. Although I am a little frustrating that fr frustrated with Zoom 
that they list German as one of their top languages and not Vietnamese. That just seems so odd to me for a company that's in San Jose that they would consider German a more popular language, nothing against the Germans, but a more popular language or import, a more necessary language to translate uh, than, the, than Vietnamese. So um, I'm glad, Tony, that you were uh, working with Zoom and hopefully they're going to upgrade that and change that. But that just seems like a, a really a ridiculous thing to, and a head scratcher, why we would have to tell our Vietnamese uh, residents go to the German language because that's where you're going to get the Vietnamese translation. It's just so silly. But I, uh, Council Member Perales, what you brought forward is really, really important. We all know how engaging our community, how important that is, whether it's on a development issue directly facing our residents and in uh, our community or the larger issues as it relates to the protests and social justice and every other issue that we're facing at the city budget, et cetera. There are budget implications and Tony, I wanna thank you for your response to the councilman's uh, memo and your uh, research on the cost of translation. Wow, it seems really expensive to translate uh, the full agenda and the, and the detail, but I don't have a sense of what that, that would cost anyway. Um, so I get, we do have to take a look at that as it relates to the budget, but I'm glad we are open to investigating and seeing what possibilities we might be able to translate and uh, at least of the printed word and, and where we may not be able to from a budget standpoint, but I'm really uh, pleased that we're open to it. I do have a question regarding Zoom technology that we're using. We live with Zoom, we jumped into Zoom. Nobody knew anything about Zoom until we started our first meeting. Now we're all pseudo experts on Zoom and that seems to be the uh, latest and greatest technology, but it is, is it the best technology for us to be using? Are there other forms of communication like this that we could be using that we should be reaching, uh, researching instead and utilizing instead? If you could, uh, Council Member, I, I think Rob Lloyd is on and maybe I you can help with uh, uh, that question. I see Rob <laughs> popped up. <laughs> Good evening, Rob Lloyd, CIO for the City of San Jose. Uh, Council Member, the answer to your question is actually twofold. We uh, started a partnership with Zoom about uh, two and a half years ago when they were still a small company to test out what could work better for video conferencing because we had a high ticket rate with our existing solutions. Um, and so it was positioned um, that when the pandemic hit, we had that tool and that partnership already there. Um, and it just so happened that it became the most popular uh, tool globally, it seems. Um, but we did actually do a review and credit to Jennifer Piazze um, as, as part of the EOC's engagement branch to take a look at all those options. And she did an assessment of what features were necessary and important um, and in that assessment, it confirmed um, that, that, um, that Zoom actually met the majority of those. The other thing I'll, I'll give credit to Zoom is that partnership actually gives us use to these resources for a lot less um, than uh, commercially available or even nonprofits can buy. Um, so they're a San Jose company and they said, we want to be part of San Jose's success. So that was an offer they made early on. So, so credit to their CEO on that one. But we were able to make this transition fast because of that preparatory work. Um, and do it well and less than other organizations, uh, for less than other organizations because of that partnership. So can you give us more? Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate that. So we have looked into alternatives and, and uh, the others aren't as strong in, in the reviews that you've done or that Jennifer has done. Uh, correct, yeah. So she went through um, all the engagement requirements and listed out certain functions that we use on how to interact with the public. Um, there probably it deserves to be said there's no perfect solution. None of them had all the language uh, features that we wanted, um, as well as the queuing um, and the hybrid virtual plus in-person type um, uh, uh, features. But um, for all the solutions that she looked at, and, and our assessment was much the same, um, Zoom was, was top of the list. Thank you. And so is the partnership, is there, you mentioned that there's a, or you alluded to the fact that there's a financial benefit to the city in that they give us service or access for it at a discounted rate. 
do you have a yeah. sense of what that discount is or what it would, if we were paying full price, what, I'm just curious, or is this sure. something um, we should be discussing <laughs> elsewhere? I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, we, we try not to put them in an odd spot, but um, uh, I, I can say we have substantial, um, many whole, hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings versus what our peers would have been paying or okay. what our peers are paying, I should say. Okay. I, I appreciate that, and I thank you for looking into other alternatives, and Councilmember Perales, I was happy to second your motion. It uh, really came at the right time, and it was very thoughtful and necessary and important for us, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Foley, and I'm sure Zoom's customer service hotline is going to be ringing off the hook any second. Um, Councilmember Depp. Yes, thanks, Vice Mayor. Uh, I, I want to join the chorus and uh, appreciate Councilmember Perales for for raising the issue. I, I think he's absolutely on point um, with this. You know, we we weren't prepared for this when it happened, but now that we've gotten our bearings, we should put some more thought into it. Um, I, I guess I just want to use my time to um, remind the public uh, that the council members and everyone at the city and any public agency uh, values public input and. Um, we're here to serve you, but but now the two minutes you have at council meeting is not your only opportunity for engagement. You know, this is the time we come and we vote for it. Um, I know that there are often uh, com complaints and about the shortness of it, uh, your, your public speaking time, and we should move the public speaking to the top of the meeting and, and all that. Uh, but I, I want to remind you that, that we, you know, do read your emails. Uh, we do have the opportunity to have public meetings or your you know, coming to City Hall or at least have a Zoom meeting with you privately uh, and it, when you want to raise your concerns with, with all 11 of us, uh, I imagine. And so uh, there are other opportunities beyond, beyond the public comment and the format of the council meeting being whenever it is. Sometimes we have to start early at 11. Sometimes we start regularly scheduled at 1.30. Uh, and, and it's not because we're trying to move the ball, but because, uh, or hide the ball rather, but because we're trying to get things done and, and end things on a, on a timely manner uh, and, and do the business of the city. Uh, so I, I would uh, just, Put that out there, um, and to the extent that we're we're you know doing as much as we can for online engagement, I would like to see the city uh, try to help communities that we're we're having the language access for um, understand the stakes of what we're talking about because. Uh, I'm, I'm personally very happy that we have a, a Vietnamese translator on the line and and a Spanish translator on the line. Uh, I'm curious though. My hypothesis is we probably don't have any Vietnamese speakers watching the meeting. Um, that that would be my personal hypothesis. Um, uh, if, if I could ask the, the Vietnamese interpreter if if there's actually anybody uh, who needs interpretation right now in Vietnamese. This is Tony. We don't get to see at at this point. The software doesn't show us who's requested interpretation. Um, that's another feature that I've I've talked with with Rob about wanting, so we can see if there's a way to pull who's who's requesting interpretation. Councilman Yep, could I just ask you if you could ask the same question and ask them to raise their blue hand? Oh sure, if yeah. The, the 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 Vietnamese interpreter could raise her hand as a panelist and just kind of let us know if there's there's a Vietnamese person listening in. So, so council member, as, as Tony was mentioning, the tool doesn't actually show the interpreters um, who's listening or, or account. They oh, just, I see. So they're just speaking into a void, basically. Basically, yeah. And, I we, see. and we did also talk with Zoom about um, those features. Just to be clear, they have a large product roadmap. Vietnamese was already in that roadmap. They were just investing in priorities in security because they want to make a big investment there and then where their customers are. And uh, they, they just happen to have, uh, apparently, they're very, very big in Germany. Um, yeah. So they, they, they went where their customer ratios were, um, sure. but, but Vietnamese was already on their roadmap. Understood. So, so I guess from, from my perspective, you know, coming from the Vietnamese community, I, I've throughout my whole life tried to, to push my elders uh, to become more civically engaged, and, and we've seen them be civically engaged, but in a very narrow band of issues. Uh, and, and in a time when our city is facing uh, difficult decisions regarding resources, um, as somebody who's done uh, professional interpretation in the past, doing live simultaneous interpretation uh, is uh, is tiring, uh, <laughs> to say the least, uh, and especially if you have to do it for eight hours straight in, in a meeting or so, and uh, even more so if, if no one's there to, to listen. So I'm not sure how, I'm not saying we don't need translation, I, we certainly do, uh, but there, we should somehow figure out a way to uh, know that there's the need there. 
Um, having somebody on, on call is great, um, but if they're talking to a void and they don't know if one person's listening or, or 20 people's listening or, or nobody's listening, uh, they're really just uh, you know, translating for translating sake. And, and I, I just don't wanna see that happen, at least for the interpreter's sake. Um, in, in addition, I, I would say that there's also things that we could do after these Zoom meetings, I think they're recorded. Um, and a lot of times people can't always watch simultaneously. Um, I think now that we're on Zoom, although I, I would rather be on the dais, you know, outside of COVID times, but I think even now that we're on Zoom, we've democratized our meetings to a certain extent. Uh, previously, there were the complaints that you're holding these meetings at City Hall and people are working and they can't be in there in person with us. Uh, now you you can turn on your computer and have it on the background as you're working from home, um, or you can watch it afterwards on YouTube, right? And I think if we can somehow make the videos of our meetings queue it up so people can go directly to the item uh, that they want to watch uh, rather than scrubbing or, or scrolling through a, a you know a lengthy meeting um, I think that would be extremely helpful and having people be able to jump from uh, the time the time mark where council starts speaking as opposed to when public comment is et cetera et cetera so these are extra things that we could also do um, on the back end to help increase public engagement if not simultaneously live then at least after the fact uh, because I, I have heard notes um, and I've seen it myself watching the YouTube video you do you do have to scroll and find what you're looking for and we should make it as easy as possible for, for whoever wants to engage uh, so those are my thoughts but uh, thank you for the the idea councilmember Perales and the direction I'll support thank you I, I uh, agree oh councilmember Sparta Sorry, I had uh, one more question. Thank you to um, Lond. Yeah, um, so for for bringing that up because it it um, raised a question in my mind, which is, um, Rob, how does the technology work? So, um, do the translations because she's speaking into it, um, and she raised her hand, Lon, I saw it. Um, do do the translations work? Are they saved so that after the meetings, because so many people use um, the video afterwards um, and the community does rely on that, is there a way for us to save those translations? Can someone choose a language online or is there a way to, to capture that so that that translation sticks around? I'm not as familiar with the translation. I, I think Tony might be able to, to give some insights on that, but the closed captioning is. So um, when that service is rendered, that, that is saved and then paired. Um, but, but Tony, do you know on the translations, uh, the direct translation, um, if that is recorded? I don't, but I just now started recording this meeting. So then I can see if, if I record it on my computer, will I get both audio or all three audio tracks? So I, I will know tonight. And we'll get back to you, council member, on that one. So uh, apologize. apologies, we don't have the answer for you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate council member Pross bringing this forward. I think uh, this is, is important and timely, as several people have said. Uh, I think council member Dieppe's comments are, are well taken, though, as well. And that is, I think we'd all agree um, that, A, we have a diverse community that clearly needs translation for those issues. Uh, where people want to be engaged, but it would be silly for us to have an interpreter who is interpreting into a void. Uh, and, and so it's raised for me the question of whether uh, it may be equally important for us to actually seek the initial engagement in those communities where people are likely to need the English or Spanish translation, and that rather than spending money directly on translation, that the dollars could be better spent either on a community organization or a media organization uh, focus specifically in that linguistic community that would both broadcast to the community that these issues are coming up on the, the agenda uh, and then translate for them. And obviously we would need to be able to monitor that contract in a meaningful way. Now that's all assuming we have the money to do all that. And we're gonna know more obviously in upcoming discussions in October because we all I think we all know we have very we have many painful decisions to make, and the same communities that we critically want to serve with critical city services are also the ones we want to reach and communicate with. Uh, and, and so we have to find a way to balance uh, the need to do both. And I think we also have to acknowledge that there are plenty of items on this agenda, uh, on our most agendas, that. Lots of people in the public really don't have any interest in, regardless of their language, and, and so 
it seems to me that the communication needs to be relevant. And, um, and so I, I just think that maybe we might need to think a bit more outside about how it is we make the bilingual or trilingual communication most relevant in those communities and what that might look like. Obviously, if we're dealing with a third party, we have to be very sensitive to bias and whatever angle they may or may not have. And, and that's, that's a challenging issue. I think we all agree. Um, but I can't help but think this idea of simply making translators available without anybody really having meaningful sense about what the issues are on the agenda, whether or not they even want to participate, uh, we're going to just be a tree falling in the middle of a forest. And, and so I, I look forward to continuing this conversation. I think it's really important. And hopefully we're gonna find a good balance. Okay, uh, there is a motion. Anything further? All right, let's vote, Tony. All right, I, I was turning off my video and not doing the screen. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, uh, on to item 3.5, actions related to agreements for food distribution related services for COVID-19. There is a presentation. Yeah, very, very briefly, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager. Uh, what you have before you are three negotiate and execute uh, amendments uh, to previously approved uh, food distribution agreements. The first one involves the San Jose Conservation Corps. What this action does is it adds uh, more compensation to the uh, contract that was approved back in, on June 23rd. Uh, it extends the term date through December 30th. Uh, as as you, you may recall, uh, we, we reached out to the San Jose Conservation Corps to replace the National Guard, which ended their deployment at Second Harvest Food Bank on uh, July 31st. Uh, we've been able to maintain seamless uh, support to the Second Harvest Food Bank, and as a result, uh, keep food distribution uh, going strong. Uh, there's a bit of a twofer on that one too, in that this also uh, enables us to really put uh, uh, up to 120 core members to work. And, and so I think uh, that also is in line, although that wasn't the direct intent of this action, I think it's, a, it's, it's an additional benefit uh, to this agreement um, and, and definitely helps spur economic recovery. Uh, the second one has to do with Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. This does not, not add any additional money. What this simply does is it extends the, uh, the, time, uh, uh, the time frame of this contract to September 30th, uh, 2020. So no change in compensation. And the last one here is first five of Santa Clara County. Again, no, uh, no change in compensation. It extends the time to December 30th, but I do want to kind of point this one out here because through this grant here, we've been able to serve uh, close to 3,800 families, uh, over 9,000 uh, babies and uh, uh, with formula, diapers, uh, essentials uh, through uh, 23 family resource centers uh, uh, operated or sponsored by uh, First Five of Santa Clara County. So uh, in the report, uh, we're available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, Angel, uh, let's go first to the public. Mm -mm. Everyone has two minutes to speak. Bruce Roberts, welcome. Uh, Bruce, you still, uh, your device appears to be muted right now. Bruce, uh, we're still not able to hear you. If you could unmute your device. Bruce, please unmute your device if you're able. Okay, Bruce, we're still not able to hear you. There seems to be some technical difficulty. Uh, why don't you give this another shot and raise your hand again in a moment as you're able to uh, figure out the device and we will come back to you. Tessa Woodmansey. 
Hi, thank you so much. This is Tessa Woodman C. Thank you so much. Um, I really like your interface with the item up there. That's really wonderful. And so we're talking about actions related to the agreement for food distribution and related services for COVID-19 pandemic. And I, I think it's very important that um, things that are happening with COVID-19 also correlate with um, climate change. And that shows the truth in the issues uh, of the answers to both are the same. The answers to COVID-19 are the same as climate change and they are to stay home and to become fiercely independent of consumerism and capitalism. And what that means is growing our own food that in order for us to go back to the, you know, to, to be fossil fuel free and the time of period that that was, was the 1700s. So that, if we're lucky, we go back to the 1700s. If we have a controlled demolition or else if it's uncontrolled, we could go much further back and lose everything because that is what can happen if we're not preparing ourselves. And as a ho homo sapiens, one of our be best features is, they call it, um, what is it, forethought forethought that we have that ability to think ahead based on the science, based on the issues, we can make decisions that are better. And in regards to this issue, we need to create food security. And like they say, if you teach a man to fish, he will you know, have food forever. And it's the same thing with food, that the food will become so expensive if we really put a price on the, on the fossil fuel that, that it takes. So what we need to do is be able to have most of us not, not the rich and the wealthy who can afford it, be able to grow food. We need to be able to grow food. So we actually have to support the um, urban sustainability through food generation, food security. And that's why I say we have really missed the point about um, Allery Middlebrook's urban, um, Center for Urban Sustainability. We absolutely need that and it should become part of our community centers now. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number ending in 5140. Yeah, I think we should uh, have Tessa go back to the 1700s or back to New York, wherever she came from. She takes up so much time talking about anti capitalism. She's a communist, and you guys give her this airtime time and sir, time again. Sir, we're, you're, you're to address your comments to the council, not to other members of the public. The issue regards food distribution. If you'd like to speak on the item of food distribution, yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Food, yeah, food distribution. yeah, you need a truck to deliver it. She doesn't get that. It's not going to be a wheelbarrow that's going to do it. You know, I mean, there needs to be a, a system set up to be able to distribute food properly. And it looks as if with these restaurants being closed down, there's going to be food distribution that's going to have to change from going to wholesalers for restaurants to wholesalers for for uh, you know regular consumers and to re and to and to uh, grocery stores and I think that that's what needs to be focused on and maybe you know use some of these large post office uh, uh, plots of land that are not are being underutilized have food distribution there in local neighborhoods people could go pick up or or purchase purchase food but uh, you know. I'm not interested in going back to the 1700s, and I would hope that this city council wouldn't give that any thought. Um, on top of that, uh, Deb Davis needs to know about a, a gate at the Rose Garden that's off its hinges that's very dangerous. If it falls over, it's going to crush somebody. Uh, I've called in about it, and no one's called me back if it's been repaired. But uh, that's something that I think is almost more important than talking about food distribution and going back to the 1700s. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Scott Largent. Great. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Actually, good evening. We're getting after five o'clock. Um, I, I, I do appreciate uh, Mayor Lombardo, uh, you kind of getting involved right there with that, with that man kind of going after tests. I, I do appreciate that. Now let's get back on, on the topic of the food distribution. I spent a lot of time over at the county building and I got to know some war veterans over there and they rely off of um, th these meals. Um, so I'll give them a ride in the van or we'll take the VTA and we go to the different locations even down near Roosevelt. And, and I've got to experience um, kind of their feedback and watching them eat these meals, kind of opening up the, the, the tray and, and, and seeing what, what was put together for somebody. 
Um, the, the, these meals, I, I, I'm not impressed. I'm, I'm just really not impressed. Our senior community deserves better. Um, they are the ones that are really relying off of this, uh, these services right now. And to see, a, like, it, it was something in the effect of, like, it was like a wrap, and it had some type of mystery meat in there. It had a, lots of uh, saran wrap around it. Um, there was something that looked like an orange, like a cross between an orange and, and, and some other tangerine-looking thing. Um, it was like the Wendy's commercial when you go, where's the beef? Now, I'm challenging you, council members and the mayor, um, go undercover boss. Go to these locations and, you know, throw on a sweatshirt, throw on a hoodie, you know, dirty up a little bit. And, and just go in there and get one of those meals. Please it, just, just do that once. And you'll see what these people are eating. And I, I just don't think it's acceptable. Uh, they need wholesome meals, like a good solid meal, meat, potatoes, vegetables. And, and I do appreciate also, Tess is spot on with that. We should be growing our own food here right now. Um, we've got people suffering in the FAA flight zone over there. We've got a garden there. We've got a massive field. Think of the quality produce we could we could run out of there. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right, returning to council. Uh, council member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Angel, I appreciate the um, the presentation. I I have some questions. I saw that we are um, we distributed 2.3 meal million meals um, this past week. I think Lee reported, and I I didn't remember to ask the question then. And I'm glad you're on now, um, because I'm wondering to what extent we're helping people who need who need groceries. Um, for a longer period of time to, to get onto the, the existing government programs that are not the San Jose um, food distribution programs. And then the same thing for, again, I, I understand having to meet that emergency need and, and we wanna continue doing that. And I, I'll make the motion in just a second, but I, I wanna know, you know, for baby formula, diapers and wipes, that sounds like WIC to me. And the women, infants, and children, um, which I believe still exists, program that still exists. And then, of course, there's, um, well, they used to call it food stamps, and they, they've changed the name about four times since then. Um, but there's, there's programs for people to go and have subsidized um, groceries. And so I'm, to what extent are we including that information? with the um, meals, and I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs are fighting. <laughs> um, to what extent are we including that information with the food that we're providing? And to what extent are we able to help people get onto those programs? And then I'm sure you know, Angel, I don't. Are those programs backed up in some way um, so, so that people are, are needing our food distribution because they're not getting on to those programs, at, you know, in a timely manner. Sorry, that was a lot of questions all at once. You know, thank you, council member. Um, yeah, you know, um, from, from, from the beginning, from the inception of our response, we reached out to the county, uh, Angela Shing over at, at CalFresh. And because we knew that, you know, in, in, you know, that in the immediate, we had to uh, respond to kind of the, the food insecurity and food need that existed. At the same time, we also know that um, you know, we, we had to also begin to take a look at options that would also help families in the long run. And so what we've done is we've actually partnered with Angela Shing and, and between our EPIO folks and their EPIO folks, we've actually did a, a significant push around getting people signed up for CalFresh. And, and just literally within the last few weeks, uh, the, the last uh, my last conversation with them, they had actually increased by more than 30% of new enrollments, right? Which is very significant. And that's a good indicator. And that's a good data point for us because really that's what we want to achieve. There were a number of families that were not taking advantage of CalFresh. 
uh, and programs such as that. And so uh, we, we feel really good about that um, strategy. We're also including that as we begin to work on transitioning this work from the city to the county. Uh, that will continue to be one of those uh, strong efforts. So uh, definitely programs such as CalFresh and, and others uh, is, is, has been incorporated in this. We, we've, uh, we provide information at all our food distribution sites uh, with respect to that. With respect to the second part of your question around the uh, the, the the diapers and formula, um, yeah, there, there are a lot of good programs such as WIC and others that, that that are still around helping families. One of the things that we saw in in some communities is that there were difficulties with some families signing up, right? Especially if it came down to needing to prove documentation or uh, status and things like that. And we are hearing, quite frankly, you know, situations where people were reusing uh, disposable diapers, you know, just the, just completely unheard of, right? Uh, and so we, you know, in partnership with, uh, with the first five and the 23 family resource centers, many of which are operated through nonprofit organizations, communities, uh, faith-based and, and so forth, um, we wanted to fill that need right away. And it wasn't just diapers, but it was also access to formula, right? Because we, we figured if, if people were having difficulty purchasing diapers, then we, we also could draw the correlation or the assumption or draw the conclusion rather that they're having just as, as much trouble, you know, buying formula. Having said that, as we're reaching out to various families, we're also uh, uh, referring them to other government-based programs to get the more long-term care because we realize the 1.5 million that we're investing in this effort here is not going to be sufficient, nor is it sustainable long-term with this funding source. So, that that's kind of uh, you know hopefully I answered your questions on those, but that, that's. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I appreciate that additional detail. And I, I, I do understand that we'll, we will have, have to continue providing meals. And as you said, transitioning that to the, to the county kind of for the long term, um, especially because of our undocumented residents, as, as well as, you know, there's a gap between the time that you apply for um, for assistance in the time that you get it, and you you probably need you need to eat during that time. It's makes sense. Um, I just am wondering, do we have any kind of um, estimate or even a guess about what that is going to look like per week on a on a go forward basis? And I know there's tons of unknowns, so I'm guessing the answer is no. We don't have an estimate. It's just 2.3 million meals a week is a is a lot. Yeah, you know, right now the agreement that we have with the county, we, we, uh, it, initially we agreed to, we agreed to a time frame ending August 30th. They asked for a one month extension. We granted that one month <coughs> extension. We also made it very clear that we really need to step up transition from the city to the county. They understand that. So September 30th really is when that transition period, at, at least the countywide focus, ends for the city of San Jose. However, uh, I want to also point out, though, that we'll still be uh, providing direct food distribution assistance within the city of San Jose at, at least through December 30th, right? That, that's kind of tied with the coronavirus funds and then the general fund emergency fund that we put aside. Uh, we also, uh, between now and then, we also need to continue to forecast what that need is going to be beyond December 30th. And so we'll, the team will be focusing on that. But uh, really, the pivot is going to be really more San Jose focused. Uh, and of course, we will remain at the table working with our city partners and the county to meet that broader need because I think it's safe to say that we really avoided a pretty major food crisis here, uh, you know, through through our quick action. But uh, as I said before, it, it, it's definitely not perfect, but it's definitely it definitely has been effective and responsive. Oh yes, I, I completely agree, and I don't want any of my comments to be misconstrued as to, <laughs> to we of course we needed to do it. We we need to continue to do it. I, I'm just trying to get a sense of um, the scope, and I and I know we're going to continue to need to do it. And with school starting, um, I think someone said some Alum Rock started today, and San Jose Unified starts tomorrow. I know um, because I have I have two starting tomorrow. Um, there, I, I assume there's going to be some decrease in the number of meals because that will shift back to the school school sites as well for for maybe breakfast. I don't even know if they're doing breakfast, but I know they're doing um, box lunch pickup. Um, so it's it's going to decrease a little bit at least as school starts. I'm guessing. Yeah. And then 
I saw Dolan put his I saw Dolan put his video on, so I'm I'm wondering if he's wanting to answer the forecast question. Well, Council Member Davis, so Dolan Beckel, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation and currently the EOC Food Branch Lead. I think to answer your question, kind of going back to the 2.3, the numbers we've been quoting are countywide. So pre-COVID countywide, if you include the school programs and, and the small amount the city of San Jose was doing for our seniors and the county programs, it was about 1.8 million. Oh. Um, so we're, we're currently seeing, we saw a peak of 3 million and the food insecurity index that Professor Starbird at Santa Clara said we could go up to 3 point, about 3.1, 3.2 million. So um, right now we're still running much higher than pre-COVID um, and, and we actually expect that to continue. We're kind of seeing that we expect that with the economy doing so well pre-COVID, um, and not needing to shelter in place. Uh, we expect to run around that 2.3, much higher than the 1.8 pre-COVID. Within the city of San Jose, we may, may see some shifting um, from some things that we were supporting back to things that the county is supporting. Um, but I think overall, if you just look countywide, we're gonna continue to be much higher than where we were in February. Right, of course. Yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate that detail. And then I'm going to go ahead and move staff recommendation on this. Second. Motion from Councilmember Davis, I believe, is seconded by Councilmember Foley. Uh, Councilmember Rennes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask and see if I heard correctly, um, Angel. Did you say that we were serving 9,000 babies with uh, diapers and formula? Yeah, exactly. that, that, that is correct. Uh, over over nine thousand babies, uh, uh, over three thousand eight hundred families. If you count it, you know, as a family, and then when you when you when you break it down in terms of per baby, over nine thousand babies. Correct. Okay, and then um, I know that you said that most of this distribution was happening at the resource centers. I I I I, I knew that. But I started thinking, I don't know if the, all of the resource centers are actually open at this point. Um, were they opening specifically just for distribution? Yeah, what, what we are doing is, so it's, there's 23 resource centers, 17 of them are actually, actually in San Jose. And so for distribution purpose initially, because that was a common point of of, of, um, of kind of convening, we we're using those sites. And then wherever uh, we weren't able to to tap into a pre-existing resource center, we used a school nearby. So for example, with the Elm Rock School District, we actually uh, um, you know, distributed uh, diapers and formula through you know, at, at school locations that were close by the, the resource center. So it, it really depended on what was available, what we had access to. And, um, and so, it was, it was, so we distributed between resource centers and school sites and uh -huh. churches. I, I'm glad to hear that. Listen, I, I think uh, the resource centers are the right um, focal point for this uh, population to receive uh, um, formula and uh, wipes and diapers. And um, as I'm listing them all off, I'm uh, this is post-traumatic syndrome because all of those things were in a diaper bag at one point in my car, <laughs> um, probably maybe up to three years ago. And, um, and I know how expensive that can be for a family, um, especially if, if somebody isn't working in, in the household, right? And so, so I, I think it, this is a, a, um, an absolutely relief for our families. Um, diapers are just, just really expensive. Um, and, and then a formula, if you have a, a sensitive, um, a child with sensitive uh, with sensitivity, then you need soy based. It just and I know from and, and I hear you, um, Councilmember Davis. I think you know we're it's it's always good to make sure that we don't supplant anything, right? And and if I know First Five well, um, and I know them well because I worked there for ten years, uh, they're very careful about not supplanting because it's against their funding. Um, Know that they fund the resource centers, and so therefore the resource centers are also going to avoid supplanting um, any service or good or program 
And so I'm, I have all confidence that they're not doing that. But just one, one point of clarification, WIC does provide uh, food and, and formula, but it doesn't provide those, um, those diapers that are just absolutely um, expensive and the wipes, right? So, so that's uh, absolutely a good help. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if uh, just to spread the wealth, if you will, will will those uh, will we continue to serve those same families um, for the remaining amount, or will there be new families coming in for um, any of the items listed? Yes. So, so right now we're, we're, we're projected to serve the, those same families and other families as, as more are ident identified. What we're also doing is working with first five to also identify other funding sources to pick up the gap as well. Right. So we, we, we view this, we view the 1.5 million through December 30th as, as being kind of the primary seed money, but uh, it's also provided, we've seen other, uh, uh, other philanthropy step up and fill gaps where, where needed. And that's really the kind of the intent. Beyond December 30th, what we've also identified is that this is definitely a need out in the community. So we're also trying to figure out how do we keep this going long term, even post COVID, right? Uh, but again, that's where the, co the continued coordination with First Five and the county as we do this transition will come into play. That's important. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, it's it, it, listen. I think what we what you're doing right now for our families is um, uh, absolutely uh, necessary, and it allows for those families to then take that income that they would normally have spent on diapers and formula and wipes, and then use it for something else, whatever other necessity that they have. So I, I think that's absolutely essential. I hope that we can continue with this kind of support, um, especially around diapers and, and wipes, um, as there is no other source for that particular, for those particular items. And uh, I'd hate to see uh, children go into the um, emergency room or uh, clinics uh, because um, families are reusing diapers, which I have heard as well, and it's just, for our children. We have a question that I and so so thank you so much for, for that work. I think it's is it's um, amazing. I know you have a team behind you who's also doing that. I see Neil Rufino online. So thank you, Neil, for your work. Um, and uh, and Ellen, um, so other question I have, and it's along the same lines that uh, Council is asking, uh, but just slightly different. So I received a notice um, in the mail saying that uh, more meals were going to be offered once again to students. But this time it says you know, add the, the amount that you would have to pay on a daily basis if you want those meals, if you wanted to pick up that meal. And by the way, it wouldn't be warm. You would have to then go back and warm it up yourself. So it's not set up for, for a hot meal, if you will. Um, so are we, are we in any way working with the schools to see if there's anything that, uh, in, in the ways that we can support those, those families uh, that can't afford that, that yeah. amount? Yeah, uh, we, we are a council member and, and, and I'll, I'll say this is easier said than done and I'm glad, I'm glad you kind of acknowledge the kind of the team that we have behind us because we got a pretty amazing City of San Jose team. Uh, as, as you see, Dolan and Neil are our food co-leads, but even behind uh, all of us here, it, it's just a, an amazing team. But to answer your question, so so we're working with more than 19 school districts and a few charters as well. And um, and and one of the things that that we're doing is we, we're you know one of our goals is to make sure that we're maximizing existing food networks. And so many of these schools are reverting back to their USDA uh, protocols and guidelines, right? And 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 which is which is a good thing because now we can maximize that USDA funding source. Now at the same time, we recognize that there's going to be some families that are going to need a little bit more than that, or are going to have additional needs. So what the team has really done, and we're coordinating this, uh, you know, district by district, is sharing with the school districts the additional food distribution sites that are available to families that they can tap into. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, Franklin McKinney School District went offline uh, on the 31st uh, to, to basically uh, uh, prepare for uh, resuming uh, August 17th. Uh, so what we did is we kind of reached out to, um, to families and there, there are 
there are approximately 11 other food distribution sites within a one mile radius, right? Now that requires, so, so it is a little bit more inconvenient because now that means instead of going to the school, you may have to go, you know, you may have to drive a, a little bit or walk a little bit, uh, but, but there's 11 food sites within one mile radius. So we're providing that information to the school districts. They're sharing it via email, their, their parent portals. Uh, we're also passing out that information at the, um, at the actual site, you know, so that we're able to kind of flyers. And, and to incentivize them as well, uh, the county through the public health department has, uh, has, has subsidized three dollar uh, off coupons to farmer market, farmers markets, and they they they're, they're good at any farmers market, and so those are ways that we're trying to kind of just close that gap. Uh, you know, it does require a lot of kind of. Uh, uh, and kind of old school, kind of just you know, spread the news. Uh, but it's definitely happening. Uh, let me pause there. Dolan, Neil, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that, but um, that's pretty much our strategy. Yeah, and so I think the only thing I would say is, is we we obviously we have some future RFPs coming uh, that community-based organizations could get creative with. So um, we have an unmet needs RFP that we're working on, which is kind of a, a general. Um, support and a community-based organization could potentially partner with the schools and and apply for that and, and help use those funds to supplement that that small that one dollar to three dollar which is still a significant amount for some families as, as kind of to supplement that so we're, we're in addition to what Angel said we're thinking of some creative ways that we can use the coronavirus fund issue an RFP and that's one channel uh, to do that that's excellent I know the uh, reduced rate, I think, uh, well, for Evergreen, I'm, for, I'm sure that uh, uh, everybody else is more or less the same, but it's 40 cents for a meal. Um, and I don't know what what requirements are, and I don't know if our families are able to meet that requirement. And so, you know, we can have a conversation with the school about that to see if they are. Um, Love. I'm sorry, Councilman Rennes, was, are you finished? Uh, no, I'm not finished. Uh, oh, my apologies. Mayor, was a, was uh, my, my son who is uh, playing in the same room as I am and um, he wasn't aware. That my apologies. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, <laughs> Um, I just needed to, to 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 let him know that everybody was listening before he went on any further. Right, right, good idea. <laughs> um, so so uh, where I was going with this is that uh, sometimes some of our families that are uh, right in the middle, they'll put it requirements either um, for the free or reduced lunch or for another program. And so they're stuck with it. I think it's worth our time to try to figure out who those are before you know, it catches up with us. Um, so that would, you know, that would be a recommendation throughout the school districts, especially those areas that have, been, that have COVID impact. Um, uh, certainly, Title One makes a lot of sense. And so, uh, it's one of the items that I was thinking about as well, going back into school mode. On the large, um, our 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 families will still need to have. Uh, food on the table, and um, I don't know how the schools are going to work out a break so that people can pick up the lunch or anything like that. But anyway, a lot of I appreciate all the work that you're doing. The logistics that require, are required in all of that. Feeding all the people that you have fed in, in our county, uh, let alone just in San Jose and in our county. I mean, it's just a moment now. So I know it's we're all in, and as we're moving through this COVID phase, different phases of kind of school, uh, but you know, we just need to adapt to to what we've seen work. work. Um, so thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll keep it short. I just wanted to say um, uh, kudos on the Conservation Corps. I think. Um, they're a great solution. Uh, a lot of other counties are using them, and they're, uh, uh, you know, a will it really uh, important resource uh, here in our city and county. And so um, I thought that was really creative. And um, so I just wanted to say great job on that. Um, 
and um, and thank you for uh, all your work ensuring that there's no lapse in the service. Um, I did um, just because you touched on it earlier. I wanted to bring up that as this you know, and hopefully we'll continue to get funding for this work. Um, but as this pandemic goes on, um, I've seen firsthand how many families are relying on it. Um, when you said 9,000 babies, um, my little heart swelled um, because I've, I've seen um, folks and how much they rely on it and, um, and the food that is out there and how much they rely on that. Um, and, uh, and just to ask that as school stops and starts that we make sure that we pay attention to that timing. Um, for example, in Santee, there was a little bit of a gap. It's not so easy for folks in that neighborhood to get in a car and go to another neighborhood, right? Most people, most of the moms there are gonna walk usually with the baby in a stroller, right? So, um, so that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and uh, lastly, because again, it came up earlier, um, I also wanted to just continue to encourage having these different sort of redundancies set up, not just for distribution, but for the food itself. Um, I know one of the reasons um, Franklin McKinley, um, you know, does daily food distribution is because so many families in that school district don't have a place to safely store several days worth of food because of the living conditions that they live in. And so I'm um, having prepared food for um, as an option for families um, is one, an important one. And so I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Camus. I'm sorry, uh, Mayor. I, I uh, well, I did get most of my question answered, but since you called on me, I, I did lower my hand. But uh, let me ask, uh, um, the, the uh, program with the Conservation Corps, and is that being sun funded by uh, CARES? Is, is that where we're getting the money from? Uh, uh, yeah, Council Member, that, uh, that is being funded out of the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, that, that was, uh, it, it was an allocation that was made. We, uh, and, and in fact, in the memo, there's kind of a, we included a table that kind of missed all the kind of the, the sources for funding. But yes, it is a Coronavirus Relief Fund. Okay. That's thank you so much. And thank you all for your, all the work that you're doing to keep our community together. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I'll ask a question that I know uh, will probably offend in, in the way that I'm, the, the terminology, but this is obviously standard social service terminology. Are we serving 9,000 unduplicated babies? Uh, are we actually serving fewer than that? Uh, yeah, well, uh, well, well, Mayor. Uh, so, so what, what what is reported up through the different um, resource centers and the different distribution points uh, the, uh, is really the thirty eight hundred, the three thousand eight hundred families. And uh, and I want to make sure we have accurate information. So, so let us get back to you on exactly how the the data uh, plays out. That could be a duplicated number. Uh, we will verify that. We do know what's unduplicated are the thirty eight hundred uh, families that we're serving. But okay. I, I want to make sure that. Yeah. So I guess that's the core issue. I just want to know how many, how many, how many human beings are out there depending on us for that service. Yes. Um, and that that's certainly helpful. Okay. Um, so if if we're, I, I can't do the math here in my head here, but is it approximately five hundred dollars a family? We think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Roughly a little 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 under that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, another another data point as I was looking at kind of my, if you kind of break this down in turn, you know, another way of looking at the data would be how many diapers and wipes were uh, distributed or ounces of baby formula. And so we actually have, we actually track that data as well. So we, we have, uh, we have distributed 249,817 diapers uh, through June 30th uh, and 934,500 wipes. And then in terms of ounces of baby formula, we've distributed over 141,000 ounces of baby formula. What I don't, what I'm not uh, clear on right now is whether it's duplicated or unduplicated, but what I am very clear on is the, the you know, what it, what it breaks down in terms of kind of a unit per service, right? In terms of diapers, wipes, right. ounces of formula. 
Yeah, I mean, I know this is this is kind of a new line of work for us, and uh, I'm just trying to understand, uh, you know, given the scarcity of resources, how, how, you know, how well we're able to to address the need. Obviously, I know we all are interested in making this as cost effective as possible, uh, and so the expectation for the 1.5 million. That's uh, forgive me. The term of the contract is for how many months? It, 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 that will run through December 30th, and there is no okay. way we'll be on that. That we, you know, we've, uh, you know, we've identified 1.5 billion through December 30th with no expectation of continued funding, other than, but with a, a an, an expectation that we would work with our partners, first five and others, to work with them to help raise additional revenue to continue to meet that need. Um, so in a lot of ways, it was kind of immediate money to address the immediate need, but with the understanding that this wouldn't be sustainable long-term, um, a community need nonetheless, but uh, we'll need to identify other ways of addressing it. And and First Five, quite frankly, is, is really taking the ball in terms of um, you know trying to find alternative funding sources to continue to meet the need. So uh, I think they're, they're in a good place. Thank you, Angel. And I, I know that uh, these reports have to be written well in advance of the council meeting. I'm just curious, where we are in the latest update in terms of cities uh, willing to their willingness to sign agreements with us, uh, where we're obviously committing significant resources for other cities. Yeah, we're we're, we're right in the middle of those conversations uh, right now, um, and so we'll we'll um, you know we do have a cross reference that's coming back um, from Smart Cities that we just did on Thursday. We could also make sure to provide an update uh, on that at, at that time as well. That'd be great. Thank you. I, I just, in a general sense, are cities willing to sign sort of compensation agreements, or is this is this a lot of hard uh, arm wrestling? We're 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 uh, we're, we're having difficult conversations. Uh, I'll, uh, we're having difficult uh, uh, conversations. I, I, I think the word I would say they're willing. The challenge right now is uh, on identifying the actual resources that go beyond. Uh, reimbursable amounts, right? Uh, there's no question, no argument around FEMA reimbursable expenses, which is about 75% of whatever those costs are. Uh, right now, the, the, the bit of a struggle uh, in terms of the feedback that we're hearing back from other cities is how to cover that additional gap of 25%. So, so uh, you know, you know, Dave, myself, Dolan, Neil, and, and others are kind of talking through that whole issue um, and. Uh, but, but right now we continue to kind of work with these other cities to kind of just, uh, you know, troubleshoot this together. Yeah, not easy. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you again to, to everyone. Uh, Dolan, Neil, Angel, everybody's working so hard to make this happen. Um, all right. Uh, then let's, um, there has been a, is there a vote motion to receive the report? I believe there was. Yes, there was. Motion in a second. Okay. Yep. Great. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Prowlis? Aye. Yep. Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, so I see I missed uh, the standard uh, break here for dinner. Uh, my apologies, I miscalculated uh, how quickly we'd resolve some of these items. So why don't we take a break now uh, and reconvene at 6.30 uh, for the remaining items on the agenda. We'll start uh, with the uh, items related to um, uh, uh, 3.6, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, outdoor commerce uh, items. Uh, I think we just have four more items to go. Thank you, everyone.